here today for our first planning committee in some considerable time here in the chamber in Straban. So it's a, it's a delight uh, for us all to be uh, back in situ uh, in this chamber to um, conduct the business of the uh, planning committee. Um, just to extend a welcome as well to um, uh, all of those who, uh, all of those of you who have uh, joined us online for uh, the business of the planning committee, um, uh, members of the public, agents, and indeed our own um, elected representatives who are members of the planning committee. So uh, we've got a considerable bit of business to get through today, uh, and so I don't intend to um, delay proceedings uh, any further. Uh, so I'm going to ask the head of planning if um, she could, uh, on, on our behalf, deal with the first two items in the agenda, and that's the notice and summons of the meeting and the uh, members' attendance and apologies. Thank you, Chair. Members, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the planning committee, which will be hybrid socially distanced meeting to be conducted remotely via Web WebEx and also physically uh, in Straban Chamber on Wednesday, the 5th of October, 2022. Alderman Alan Breslin. Here, Moira. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Here, Moira. Thanks, Keith. Alderman Drew Thompson. Here, Moira. Thanks, Drew. Councillor Jason Barr. Here. Thanks, Jason. Councillor Raymond Barr. Here, Moira. Thanks, Raymond. Councillor John Boyle. Here. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Councillor Dobbins. I'll come back. Councillor Paul Gallagher. And Shaw. Ma. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Shaw. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Councillor Kelly, I'll come back. Yeah. Councillor Kelly? No. Uh, Councillor Patricia Logue? Okay. Councillor Kieran Maguire? Councillor Kieran Maguire? No. Councillor Philip McKinney? Thank you, Philip. And Councillor Sean Mooney? Here. Thank you. I'll just go back, Chair, and a few of those call out again. Um, Councillor Angela Dobbins? No. Councillor Dan Kelly? No. And Councillor Kieran Maguire? That's it, Chair. Thank you. There's Councillor Dan Kelly. Ah, here we go. Okay, so can we, Councillor okay. Kelly, just Councilor join Kelly us physically in the room? Us. You're very yeah. welcome, Councillor Kelly. Um, sit wherever you're comfortable, Dan. Um, okay, members. Uh, so that's our uh, first two items in the agenda, and of course now we'll move to the um, the broadcast statement. So um, I'd like to remind everyone present at this meeting in the gu in the Guildhall, or indeed here in Straban. They haven't reprinted it for me. Uh, uh, or here, of course, is uh, in attendance remotely, that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. The broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with council protocols. Due to your attendance at this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Um, members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. And a copy of the Council Privacy Notice may be found on the Council website at www.derrystabram.com. Okay, so, members, item number four, declarations of interest. Um, uh, again, uh, open to yourselves now. Uh, this is your opportunity to declare any interest that you have uh, in relation to today, today's business. Uh, and I have here uh, uh, Councillor Oak. Uh, Chair, uh, item number five, um, LA11 slash f And the applicant is a relative through marriage. 
Thank you, Councillor Logue. Um, uh, if you feel it appropriate, then of course, uh, you know that the, the protocol would require that you would leave the room when we're here in that uh, particular item. Uh, so, uh, any other declarations of interest from members who are online with us today? I now know Councillor McGuire has now joined us. Uh, Councillor McGuire, uh, we will mark you present and uh, again, welcome. No other declarations of interest at this time, members. And of course, um, if you feel that uh, through the course of the business that, the, that, that there has been something that might arise that might consider, you may consider a declaration of interest then again, um, do make that known to uh, the meeting in general. Um, so, uh, item number five on the agenda is a chairperson's business. As is uh, normal with me, I haven't got any chairperson's business um, uh, in relation to planning. Uh, I'm sure I could think of many other things we could bring into chairperson's business, but they wouldn't be germane uh, to what we're here to discuss today. However, uh, again, as is normal, um, uh, Maura is going to talk us through uh, some of the items on uh, the agenda for decision, um, uh, and then we'll take it from there. So over to you, Maura. Thank you, Chair. Members, I have a list of some late items which has been circulated prior to the, the meeting. Um, and just to sort of highlight what they are. Um, item two, we have a late item, four photographs, um, uh, which have been submitted on behalf of the objector in relation to item two. Um, item five, we have a, a written statement which is submitted um, by the agent. And item seven, we actually have um, a submission by the agent, which is to withdraw the application from the planning system. So that needs to come off the agenda. So, um, and also members, to update you in terms of item two um, on the agenda, we've had a, a site visit request from a member of the planning committee. And this was discussed and agreed with the head of planning and chair, and that has been granted. So that item also will be taken then for a site visit, and the admin team will be in touch to arrange that. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maura. Okay, members, so um, uh, clearly that's cut the workload down a little bit for you all this afternoon. Um, so items number two and items number seven won't be heard uh, today. Uh, however, uh, Maura did reference uh, late items, uh, uh, and so there, that means that there does remain one late item in relation uh, to item number five. I'll give you appropriate time to read through that, um, uh, but uh, the first thing I would like to do before we do that would be to go through uh, matters arising from the open minutes um, of the 7th of September. Um, uh, so, uh, are there any matters arising uh, for members in relation to that meeting? And then matters arising from the reconvened uh, planning committee of the 8th of September. And again, no matters arising in relation to that. Okay, members, so um, we will of course, we're moving on to the planning application list with recommendation for decision. However, as I indicated, uh, I'll give you a few minutes um, to uh, have a look over that one uh, last late item uh, of information, uh, which is pertaining to item number five. So uh, we'll take five, ten minutes and see how see how we get on with that. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Logue. I'll give you that running order now. Um, yeah, didn't have it in front. Maybe it's just been added to me, so thanks. Uh, running order uh, will be one, three, number one, number three, number four, number five, and number six. So not much in the way of the change, nothing wrong in order there, Patricia. Um, okay, so we'll take five, ten minutes to have a look through that, um, that late item, uh, and then we'll come back to uh, our first matter for decision.
Again, just for the benefit of those that may have been a wee bit late, I'll, I'll go through that running order again. Uh, so the running order is one, three, four, five, and six, and two and seven have been removed from the um, uh, agenda items for decision today. So that's one, three, four, five, six. Members, are we all good to go? Yeah, all content. Okay, okay, members. Um, so that late item obviously referenced um, application number five. So um, that's that's obviously for for later. Uh, so we we'll move on to recommendations for decision today, and we'll start with uh, item number one, LA eleven forward slash twenty twenty two forward slash. Um, zero one one four forward slash rm uh and again recommendation here is for approval and the officer who's going to take us through that uh is uh sarah so um over to yourself sarah thanks chair item one is la 11 2022 rm this is a proposed residential development of 252 dwellings comprising of a mix of 10 detached 179 semi-detached nine number townhouses and 54 apartments with public open space an equipped children's play area it community hub meeting space car parking landscaping and associated site and access works and the site is located on land southeast of the a2 Clooney road and east of numbers 29, 30, 31 and 32 Grantia Park, but the recommendation is to approve. So this is the site location plan and aerial photograph of the site. The application site is the H30 zoned housing land as defined in the dairy area plan. H30 zoning benefits from outline planning permission with an agreed concept master plan for the site for approximately 750 dwellings. Outline planning permission was granted by committee in September 2019. Two reserve matters applications have also subsequently been approved for approximately 739 dwellings and a local convenience and neighbourhood centre. Development has now commenced on the H30 zoning. So this is a photograph within the site and view of the newly constructed access. This is a photograph of ongoing works within the site that are currently taking place. This is the photographs of the lower development road, which is under construction and a view towards the north of the site. This is the proposed location of the open space and the suds pond. And just another photograph showing that the access under the H30 site is from the fourth arm of Grancha roundabout. So this slide shows the previously approved layout and LA 11 2019 rm grant was granted permission for 295 dwellings. And this approval was for phases one to three of the H30 zoning. So this is the proposed application site layout and it relates to phase one and part of phase two. This current application is for a change to the portion of that approved RM application and includes phase one, a portion of phase two lands of the zoning. The application is for 252 units and replaces approximately 197 units within the previously approved layout. This is an increase of approximately 55 units in this part of the site from that previously approved. 
A letter from Choice House and Association was submitted within the supporting documentation which accompanied the application, which states that Choice Housing will have identified the site as being suitable to meet local social housing need and they will partner with South Bank Square in the delivery of the development. And the agent advised it was necessary to revisit this part of the site to achieve a suitable housing mix and house sizes for social and affordable housing. So in terms of the consultees, these are all set out in the report and none of the consultees have any objections. Northern Ireland Housing Executive were consulted on the application and in a response dated on the 29th of April 22, the Housing Executive advised that although the development proposal does not sit comfortably within a dis district housing needs assessment area, the site is in a popular location with social housing applicants from across the city and for applicants for three waterside housing needs assessment areas. When combined, the three housing waterside needs assessment areas have a current housing need projection of 776 units. On this basis, the housing executive confirmed housing need at this location and agreed to support a social housing mix of 183 units. The application proposal is for 252 units, of which 183 are supported by the housing executive. In an email from the housing executive on the 30th of August, they confirmed that they met with Choice Housing Association and it is the intention to deliver 190 social housing units with the balance of the 62 units to be delivered by Choice, 42 homes for sale and 20 apartments for private rental. So the policy context is on the slide there and is also set out in the report. So in terms of this housing proposal, this application is essentially a change to the density and increase in the number of units by approximately 55 units in phase one and part of phase two from that which was previously approved. This changes elements of the housing layout. However, the internal road network, bus route, provision of strategic open space, including the proposed suds for the site remains unchanged. There is a change to the location of the play park, which was previously located within a circus, which facilitated the bus turning circle within the site, and this has been relocated within this proposed layout. Overall, the layout is in broad conformity with the concept master plan for the H30 zoning, and this proposal will provide a mix of semi-detached, detached two-storey dwellings, as well as single-storey semi-detached and detached bungalows and apartments. So this is some sections through the site, and as this is a sloping site, cut and fall will be required to provide a platform for building on and to provide an adequate road network. The layout takes account the levels of the site and where retaining structures are required, these have been carefully considered by the design team. Comparison sections were submitted of the approved reserve matters and the levels as proposed, which has enabled officers to fully assess the changes between the proposed and the approved plans. The previous approval had split level dwellings to overcome the level changes. This reserve matters layout has increased the separation distances of those properties between the lower and upper roads and provided an increased depth of landscape buffer in comparison to that of the previous approval. This therefore decreases the potential for overlooking between properties and reduces the visibility of the backs of dwellings fronting the upper, upper road. And this is just another site section showing the landscape buffer between the properties on the upper and lower roads. So this is the elevation design of the mansion apartments, which are located as a focal building when entering the site. And this photograph shows the location of where the mansion apartments will be located and the trees in the distance there in the photograph are also being retained. This is a semi-detached house type M1 and A1 and a sample of the semi-detached single-storey three-bedroom bungalows and the detached four-bedroom bungalow. As stated, mature trees in the Lanier Park are being retained and protected. In terms of public open space, the open space is as per the agreed concept master plan, which was approved at outline stage. There's a large area of amenity space, including parkland to the north of the site and adjacent to Cluny Road, which also includes a pond, the main equipped area of play on this part of the site. This application also proposes an IT hub, which is a community facility for occupiers of the development, which will also be located adjacent to the park. There are dedicated pedestrian and cycle routes through the areas of open space. It is important to note the location of the equipped play area has been re relocated within this application to that of the previous approval. This proposal will also provide a linear park on the southern boundary of the site, which is a central feature of the overall H30 site. The linear park provides an accessible landscape setting and will provide play equipment and passive amenity uses. 
There are also two other additional pocket urban parks on corner roads within the site. As part of the Section 76 legal agreement associated with the outline permission, prior to the occupation of a dwelling, the developer will be required to submit and write in the details of the open space manager for the site, including the play areas and the suds. During the processing of this application, it was indicated that Choice Housing would be responsible for the management and maintenance of all the open space areas. So this slide just shows you the location of the previously approved play park. Through the processing of the application, it was agreed that the road network at this circus could be redesigned and the equipped play park relocated into the main area of open space. Officers do consider that this is a safety benefit for the residents and users of the park, as this has allowed the bus turning circus to be relocated. And that slide just shows you the relocated play park and the bus turning area. So in terms of public transport, the slide shows you the public transport and bus route phases. So within the public transport agreement, the developer will construct each phase of the bus route at certain trigger points. At stage one, this would be prior to occupation of the 50th dwelling, stage two, occupation of the 160th dwelling, and stage three, occupation of the 395th dwelling. Given that there is an increase in the number of units in this application, a reduction in parking provision for the site, and that this proposal is for social housing, officers tried to negotiate with the agent team that the public transport would be provided further within the site and be facilitated through the upper roads within the application, which would then serve the wider H30 zoning. However, to facilitate the bus to the upper part of the site, this would require the main road within the development to be widened to 6.7 metres, which is the appropriate width to accommodate a bus. If the road is constructed at 5.5 metres width, as shown in this reserve matters, then it may not be possible to provide a bus service to the upper roads within the wider development. However, the layout and the red line of the application site would be required to be amended to introduce and provide the adequate road width to accommodate extension of the bus route into the site from that which was previously approved. And this would have a knock-on effect on the development already approved and could not be accommodated within the red line of this application site without impacting on the housing laid and the future approved phases. This reserve matters application is, however, in broad conformity with the CMP and the legal agreement, and therefore officers could not insist on the bus route extending into the site through this application. So in terms of parking, officers did raise concerns that only some of the dwelling units within the site had only one parking space per unit. However, under policy AMP7, a reduction in parking may be accepted where it forms part of a package to promote alternative transport modes and reduced parking may be acceptable in locations which are highly accessible and well served by public transport. On balance, officers considered that the reduced parking on the site would be acceptable. The site will be served by public transport at three different stages, whilst officers' preference would be that the bus route would be extended further into the site. The developer is providing a limited number of travel cards as required by the Section 76 legal agreement, which will also encourage use of the bus service. There are existing bus stops in Cluny Road and Crescent Link, and a non-motorised user connection will be provided through the site to Crescent Link. This site is within walking distance to the shopping facilities at Crescent Link Retail Park, schools, a hotel and other facilities. And the approved reserve matters for phases three and four also includes detailed proposals for retail, creche and a gym, which will be provide local facilities within this site. The site benefits from high quality pedestrian and cycle routes in the area. And overall, it is considered that there is accessibility for residents to travel by alternative modes of transport to and from the site and therefore reduced parking is acceptable. So just to summarise, this proposal is in accordance with the area plan. The reserve matters layout is in broad conformity with the outline planning permission and the CMP. The layout is acceptable under policy QD1 of PPS7. There's provision of infrastructure works in accordance with PPS3. Provision of sewerage and land drainage in accordance with PPS 15. Protection of archaeology and built heritage in accordance with PPS 6. And protection of natural heritage interests in accordance with PPS 2. So the recommendation is to approve subject to conditions in the report. The draft roads conditions as provided in the report by DFA Roads will however remain in draft form until the PSD drawings have been signed off by the principal roads engineer. Therefore, officers would ask for delegated authority to fin finalise the conditions, but it is not expected that there would be any significant variations to the wording of the draft conditions that are within the report. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sarah. Um, very con comprehensive report. Um, I'm sure members have taken a considerable amount of time to read through that report. And so just uh, thank you to all the, the, the other members of the officer team who were uh, involved in uh, presenting the report. Uh, clearly, members, this is an abridged version of, of what you all have in front of you. Um, however, uh, online, we do have uh, the agent uh, on behalf of the applicant, Tom Stokes. Uh, Tom, you're very welcome. Um, you know the drill. You've got five minutes to address the committee members. We also have uh, present along with uh, Tom Martin Mallon, who's the applicant, Chris Bell, an architect, and John Anderson, who's a representative of Choice Housing. They're only <clears throat> they're only online in case there's any questions that you might want to ask them. But in the meantime, uh, Tom, I invite you now to uh, address the committee. Thank you, Chair. Can I just check? You can hear me, okay? You're coming through loud and clear. Perfect. Chair members, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to address the committee this afternoon. As you've heard from the chair, with me online is Martin Mall, the applicant, John Anderson, development director from Choice Housing, and Chris Bell, who's the project architect. And we're all happy to answer any questions at the end. The application represents an amendment to phase one of the H30 concept master plan. The site originally formed part of the first reserve matters approval, which was granted permission by this committee around March 2021. The main reason for the amended proposals before members this afternoon is a change from the originally envisaged development of private housing to a social housing led proposal, which will be delivered by South Bank Square in partnership with Choice Housing Association. As you've seen in Sarah's presentation, the city has a chronic housing shortage, with the housing projection in the waterside area of around 776 and citywide of 3,679. This proposal will go some way to addressing this shortage by contributing 252 new social, affordable and starter homes. The mix of housing includes for two, three and four bed general needs houses, one and two bed general need apartments, three and four bed wheelchair accessible bungalows, one and two bed wheelchair accessible apartments, and two bed category one over 55s. The amended proposals for social housing have resulted in a number of benefits to the layout when compared to the previous approval. These include, as you've seen from the slides, the relocation of the children's play area from the original circus, which as you might recall, some members, members had raised concerns with previously. Provision of an additional children's play area adjacent to plot 248 and a new viewing point seating area adjacent to plot 188, and these are the little open space nodes as you work your way up through the site. The inclusion of the community IT hub and retention of additional trees within the linear park, which were originally agreed for felling in the original proposal. Overall open space is around 28% of the site area. In addition, the firm commitment to deliver housing in this site from Choice Housing Association provides much more certainty around the timing and delivery of the off-site highway works. The private housing scheme would have been totally reliant on market demand, whereas it is the intention of South Bank Square and Choice to deliver the 252 units within three years. In conclusion, the proposals are in conformity with the outline master plan and represent an overall betterment and improvement to the previously approved reserve matters. The development deliver a spacious and high quality residential scheme. The design team and myself would like to thank you and your officers and the statutory consultees with whom we have worked collaborative, collaborative, collaboratively with over the last eight months to ensure the proposals represent the best possible solution to delivering much needed housing. As some of the members may be aware, site works are currently ongoing under the original permission on this site and subject to the outcome of committee today, our client hopes to commence works constructing dwellings immediately with first houses anticipated for handover in summer 2023. Finally, this proposal and partnership between South Bank Square and Choice Housing represents an initial investment for phase one of around 35 million pounds into the city and an overall investment for the entire site of around 125 million pounds, which is a huge commitment by Choice into this council area. This partnership between Choice and South Bank Square will support hundreds of construction jobs and the local supply chain over the next five to 10 years. Your officers have recommended the application for approval, and we'd respectfully request the committee endorses this recommendation. 
Thank you, Chair and members, for your time. And Martin, John, and Chris and I are happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Tom. Um, okay, members over to yourselves. I have one indicated speaker in the chamber uh, so far, um, Councillor uh, Christopher Jackson. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to, to Tom for, for coming. And I just want to start by saying that it's it's great to be back in the Straban Chamber. Um, and and it's it's great to see the one of the first applications that we come come back is is the that's go in some way to address the social housing need, the chronic social housing need um, within the water side. Um I, I would, Jackson, at this point this is open for questions uh, to the uh, agent. Right. Um no bar chair. Um and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the agent for coming along and congratulating the team um for for um all the work that they've put on. My view is that this application improves on the on on the application that was that was the scheme that was previously approved by this committee. Um and I want to thank the, the applicants and the agents for for the work involved in that and taking into consideration the, the views that was expressed by this committee when we were deliberating on the, the previous application. Um, but when I when when you compare the, the two applications, one of the big um, changes in, in this and, and in my view it's a game changer is the, the partnership approach from Choice Housing. And I know um chaired the the, uh, the agent um, Mr Stokes referred to um, John Anderson, who's who's here representing Choice Housing. I just wouldn't mind uh, asking a direct question um, in relation to that partnership approach. And uh, and, and I know there's, there's there was reference there around the certainty um, of, of delivering the entire scheme, um, given the uncertain climate that that's involved in the, in the construction market, so I, I think that's that 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 is a game changer. It it could be key to unlocking the huge um the the the, the huge need to address some of the existing traffic issues around um the call roundabout. So, um, I. I suppose I just wouldn't mind learning more about that partnership agreement with Choice Housing, and um, I suppose as as Choice Housing committed the a long term partnership through the dollar schemes or dollar phases of this particular scheme because it's it's certainly a very positive development um, as opposed to current in comparison to. The previous application that we discussed at this committee. So I just wouldn't mind delving into that a wee bit more around the partnership approach with Choice Housing. And and, and just to thank um all the work that was done to improve the previous approved scheme. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jackson. Um so um uh, Tom, uh John, that's a, a a question for you guys to answer there from Councillor Jackson. Yeah, again. Thank you, Councillor Jackson, um, for the kind words as well for the um, design team. Very much appreciated. Um, through the chair, um, John Anderson is online. I can um, see him. He's just come in there, so I'll, I'll pass over to John to answer that. Thank you. And, and thank you for the question, Councillor Jackson. So I suppose to be very brief about it, the choice commitment to the site is such that the way this agreement with SBS is structured um, when we completed the contract, I think last December, Choice took ownership of the entire site. So as we sit here today, Choice own the not just Bays One, but the entire lands there with, at Ballyown. So obviously, with that, that has been a massive financial commitment for us, the biggest commitment we certainly have ever made anywhere in the province. So, in short, I think I can summarise by saying we have a, 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 in some ways, quite complex agreement, but other ways, straightforward agreement with SBS, where under the way that's structured, we bought the land up front and then we bring forward over a period of eight to 10 years, five phases um, for, for development. So, we, we have wholly committed to delivery of this scheme with a financial outlay of 
of, of tens of millions at this stage for the for the land. Thanks for that, John. Okay, to answer your question. Yeah, okay. Um, Councillor Mooney. Chair, I have no questions. I was uh, anticipating a proposal from Councillor Jackson. We, we would be putting questions to the officer um, before we get to that stage, I'm sure you're aware. So there aren't any further questions to you, gentlemen, unless there are anybody online that wants to ask anybody, but certainly none in the chamber. Um, okay. Uh, no doubt uh, uh, there will be further commentary uh, when we're when we're finished addressing the officers, gentlemen. So um, uh, and I'll, I'm going to afford people the opportunity to to uh, to make those comments. Um, uh, but uh, protocol at this point is to thank you for uh, coming along, and presenting to us for now, uh, and taking uh, that one question. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, pass over for uh, questions to our officer members. So again. Over to yourselves. You have no question. You have no question. Go ahead, Councillor Jackson. Um, thanks, Chair, and thanks again, D. Sarah, for for the very comprehensive report. Um, I've I've said it as as you reminded me. Um, there's that this is a much improved scheme. Um, and, and compare and comparison the. The, the previous application that came before this committee. Um, and I want to again thank the, the all everybody that was involved in getting it this far. There's a huge social housing need in the in the across this district. Um, and there's I'm acutely aware of of the need within the, the water side. This application not only will address um a big part of the social housing need. Um, um, well, let's not kid ourselves. It's not going to address all the social housing need. There's, there's certainly, um, there are certainly huge swathes or pockets of need right across the watershed. And I look forward to seeing applications come forward in that respect. Um, but what this application will do um, is it, it, it actually will create a, a whole new community. Um, and it's good to see community facilities, play facilities, um, come forward in the first phase of the application. Um, there's the, there was concerns in the re, in the previous application around road safety, around the location of a play park. These applications have have been addressed, or these uh, concerns have been addressed within this application, and I'm really pleased to see that the the, the partnership approach with Choice Housing. The, the, fir the firm commitment that we've heard from them today around the delivery of the entire scheme is, 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 is as I've said, it's a, it's a game changer. Um, it's it's going to um, hopefully fast track the ma massive improvements that's needed uh, along the call roundabout. So um, that's that, that, that's going to come as a huge benefit to the watershed. Um, so I'm delighted the they see this come before the committee today, and I'm more than content to um, propose that we accept the recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Minnie. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to um, the applicants for bringing the proposal and for Sarah for extensive work she's done in this application. You can see it's been um, it's a fine application as it has come forward now. Um, previous application needed some addressing and some amendments, but that's been done. And as I sit here now, there's two other waterside conjures in the room and there's one online and I can see that I'm happy with this proposal and it's like the rest are, but um, it's just, as, as Councillor Jackson has said, it's a, it's, it's a welcome, um, it's a welcome addition that we can see this partnership approach work. We now have, uh, we now have 252 dwellings coming and uh, 193 are going to be, um, Brought on site by choice housing for people in our city and district who are in need of the, these types of houses. So on that note, Chair, I'm very happy to second this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Um, any other members want to make comment? Uh, Councillor McKinney. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and as a waterside uh, councillor, uh, it's fantastic and fully endorse us and support uh, what uh, Councillor Jack proposed and seconded by Councillor Milley. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Um, members, just to reflect, and quite, you know, obviously, uh, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Mooney, uh, Councillor McKinney, as well as say, Councillors, uh, and of course, um, Alderman Thompson online here as well. I'm sure you're all delighted to see this. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you've spoken for everybody on the planning committee because it is a, a very, very positive development um, moving forward. It will go some way, but you're quite correct, Councillor Jackson, um, and, and others will agree. It will not go all the way. It won't touch the sides in relation to uh, some of the challenges around provision of social housing, um, but it certainly will help. Uh, and that's something I think that we all uh, recognise and appreciate. Uh, I think per of particular importance, actually, is that um, Mr Stokes um, told us that they intend to commence immediately. Uh, and again, that's extremely welcome. Uh, the fact that um, uh, Choice Housing uh, have now taken ownership um, uh, and inverted commas, whatever that means, because we don't see that contract, uh, it bodes well for the future of the rest of the development of the site. And a £125 million investment is certainly uh, very, very significant from a social housing provider uh, anywhere in the north. Uh, and it's brilliant to see that the, those uh, first houses um, will potentially be available uh, spring, early summer of uh, next year. So no time uh, is being wasted. And I'm fairly sure, uh, I speak on behalf of the uh, officer team here as well, that um, they will do all in their power to ensure uh, that things continue to go smoothly. Uh, appreciate and recognise as well that the applicant did uh, take particular cognizance of some of the commentary from previous meetings in relation to the last uh, time uh, th th this application came in front of us. Uh, and that's good to see because that, see, that shows us that developers are listening to elected members who are clearly the representatives of community. Um, I just want to finish by uh, uh, thanking all involved and in, in progressing the application through. And again, uh, wishing the uh, developers and Choice Housing and all associated with it uh, all the best um, uh, moving forward. Uh, I'm looking forward uh, to a time and uh, the hopefully not terribly distant future when the rest of the site begins to develop and then we see movement uh, on the alleviation of the traffic pressures in and around the core roundabout uh, as already referenced as well. We know that won't happen now with this element of it, but um, uh, that's expected to progress as time goes on. So again, members, uh, it's been proposed by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Mooney, uh, I haven't heard anything in the way of um, dissension. However, I am going to take a, a vote anyway from each and every one of you because we do have members online. Okay, Morris, so just uh, shout it out there. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is recorded vote for item one um, to accept the officer's recommendation to approve. Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Key. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Alderman Drew Thompson. For. Thank you. Councilor Sorry, for, for Mara. Apologies. Thank you, Keith. Councillor Jason Barr. For. Thank you. Councillor Raymond Barr. For. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. For. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher. For. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Councillor Patricia Logue. Thanks. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Or. or. Thanks, Kieran. <clears throat> Councillor Philip McKinney. Or. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. Thank you. Such. Unanimous members, thank you very much. And again, uh, Thank you to um, Tom, Martin, Chris uh, and John for attending this afternoon. And again, I repeat, we all wish you all the very best with uh, uh, the progression of uh, the application moving on from here. And, and, and certainly do look forward to the fact that uh, you're going to get going and get the ball rolling uh, as quickly as he said uh, you would do. So thank you very much. Members, moving along now to item number two in the agenda, which is actually not item number two, it's item number three. Um, Item number three in our agenda, uh, LA 11 forward slash 2021 forward slash 1168 forward slash F. Um, uh, proposed two story dwelling associated site works lands adjacent to 78 Limavati Road. Uh, and again, the recommendation here is to approve. 
Um, and Malagi, I believe uh, you're going to take this one for us. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, item three is LA 11 2021 1168. It's a full application for a proposed two story dwelling and associated site works. And it's located at Lamavadi Road. Um, the application the recommendation is to approve. Um, the site location is uh, set out before you. The application site lies to the north of 78 uh, Lamavadi Road and is accessed off an existing residential development known as Broomhill Mews, which accesses onto the main Lamavadi Road. It also lies to the northwest of uh, the Broomhill Hotel. Um, the site is outlined in red. Um, currently, has the, the the remains of a, the foundations of a previous building on the site. Um, the boundaries uh, along the western side of um, Broomhall Mews are undefined. There's an art and a security fence that's uh, been erected. The the boundaries to the the um, the Broomhall side as well on the east are undefined. There's mature vegetation along the north uh, to, uh, where it bounds with Broomhall Mews properties. And this overhead view of the site will give you an, an idea of the the site and its current surroundings. Um, so it says the site uh, currently has a, has a brownfield site, given there's an exist, uh, there's a remaining foundations of a previous dwelling that was on site. And this amount will give a block plan of the proposed uh, dwelling. Um, it's a, a large detached dwelling, um, split level. Um, the, the proposed elevations, we have a two storey, uh, the slight split level of a single storey above. It's a modern design. Uh, again, here's photographs of the, the application site as viewed from Broomhall Mews. You'll see the existing security fence with uh, Broomhall Hotel and, and the rear. Uh, and you can just see the, the roofs of Broomhall Mews, uh, which lie to the north of the site. Uh, there's a, an existing uh, gated um, fence, uh, which has been described as an access by the applicant. So in terms of policy context, we have the RDS, the dairy area plan. Um, given the nature of the development, we've also taken into consideration the SPPS, PPS free in relation to access, we've been parking PPS seven uh, and its addendum uh, regarding safeguard and character of established residential areas and PPS 12 uh, in relation to housing and settlements. And we've also taken into account the supplementary guidance uh, in relation to housing and existing urban areas and vehicular access standards, as well as creating places. Um, the applications before us today, because we've received more than, than five objections from separate properties in the locality. Um, the objections and representations are detailed in the case officer report. Before you hear a summary of the representations. Um, so in summary, there's issues relating to the ownership of the site, um, issues relating to right of ways uh, in relation to the site and to and from the site, concerns regarding the proposed access in terms of safety, concerns uh, regarding impact on character of the area, concerns regarding removal of ecological features and failure to adequately replace them, um, access to sewage means being in third party land, um, questions regarding the neighbour notification process, uh, the potential for increased runoff from site. Uh, in addition to the above, there were several objections made in relation to a previous application that cannot be addressed under this current one. So uh, and in relation to the application, we consulted a number of bodies. Uh, NA Water have no objections and have provided advice. Uh, Locks Agency have no objections, Environmental Health have no objections, have provided advice relating to potential noise. Um, DFA Roads have no objections, subject to standard conditions. Um, and NIE were consulted and have uh, highlighted that there is uh, their network is in existence and uh, if approval is granted, they should liaise with them in terms of uh, location of uh, underground cables. So in consideration of the plan application, it's officers view that the proposal is in keeping with the scale and character of the immediate area. 
the house type is a part two story contemporary design. Um, there are no archaeological vault heritage uh, features within the locality. The rear amenity uh, private space is in excess of the recommended uh, 70 square meters within creative pl creating places. Um, the site is close to public transport links and shopping facilities within the locality. DFA roads have been consulted and have no objections. Um, and there is an adequate drive and parking area look, um, within the provided site. In terms of design, um, the, again, it's a two story um, contemporary dwelling and a relatively large plot. It is in keeping with the surrounding residential character. Um, in terms of residential amenity, the dwelling is sited approximately 16 metres and 34 metres from the nearest point. So the dwelling is at 16 Broomhall Mews uh, and 78 Lama Brady Road, respectively. Um, upper floor windows to habitable rooms look to the rear of the application site or towards number 78, which has a long rear garden and won't be impacted. Um, there's a quite a substantial uh, mature boundary between the, the site and 16 Broomhall Mews, so there will be no overlooking an impact in that respect also. So overall, there's no concerns uh, um, with loss of immunity to existing um, properties in the locality. And in terms of density and plot size, it's officers' opinions that the, the proposed development uh, is commensurate with existing character uh, on the Limavati Road and the general locality around Broomhall Mews. Um, we've also looked at uh, the addendum for PPS7, which uh, takes in the other, into consideration our character issues. So again, we're, we're satisfied that the pattern of development reflects the, the general uh, existing provision in that locality. And the proposal adheres to Annex A of the addendum to PPS7, which deals with uh, minimum um, SPIS standards for dwellings. It is a three bedroom dwelling measuring approximately two, 260 square meters, which is well above the recommended recommendations of the addendum. Um, the proposal fits neatly amongst the, the mixed density area on a brownfield site of a former dwelling uh, and is uh, located in good proximity to public transport links along the Lumavati Road. Um, the proposal is in keeping with larger residential developments adjacent to Lumavati Road. Uh, and uh, is comparable um, with the quite modern development at number 78, uh, which is to, to the immediate south of the site. The design materials are a high standard and reflect the, the site context. Um, the access proposed directly on their, onto Brimhill Mews has been uh, looked at and cleared by DFA roads as uh, safe and achievable in terms of the existing network and uh, development layout. So overall, uh, taking into account um, the existing policy context, the comments and uh, representations, and the the comments of consultees, officers conclude that the proposal meets the policy requirements of the Dairy Area Plan, the SPPS, PPS3, PPS7, and the relevant addendum, and PPS12, and officers' recommendation related to this application is to approve. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mulligan. Again, thank you to yourself and other officers for for uh, preparing that report and going through it for us. Um, members, we do have uh, the agent uh, on behalf of the applicant online here, uh, Mark McIver. Mark, you're very welcome. Again, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Good to see you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, so Mark, um, uh, I'll give you five minutes to uh, address the committee and then uh, I'll turn it over to them for any further questions that they might have for you. So I'll just pass it directly to you now. Thanks for that, Chair, and thank you, Maliki, for that uh, comprehensive planning summary. Uh, I, I don't have too much to add myself. I just thought I would recap on some of those points and then make myself available for any questions should they arise at the end. Um, so just taking it from the beginning, this is a proposal for a single dwelling on, a, on Brownfield land. The site itself is set within a residential area that formerly was used for a house, uh, as was referenced in Maliki's report with reference to the foundations that are currently visible on the site. Uh, the proposal will deliver a high quality modern home that will enhance the appearance of this in full site. The development, if approved, 
will be sustainable and is close to local amenities. There's been no objections received from statutory consultees and the proposal is fully compliant with plan and policy. So we would request that uh, approval is granted, but obviously if there's any queries or questions, I'm, I'm here to try and answer those. Thank you. Okay, Mark, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for keeping it brief. Uh, I think probably it is more appropriate that you, you, you um, answer any of the questions the committee may have. Um, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Chair. And I suppose I have two questions, and um, if one of them might be for yourself, but um, and I suppose I'll get to that one first. Um, it, I, I know in the report there was a number of objections, um, and I suppose just either yourself or the, uh, the head of planning have the objectors been afforded the right to address the committee? Because I just note, and uh, I'm assuming that the, the agent, their applicant spoke first, then then there isn't any speakers on behalf of the objectors. And then I suppose just in relation to a question, the, the applicant, um, there, there, there does seem to be, and reading from the report and some of the representations from the objectors, we all know the, of the, the concerns around access on the Lamavari Road. And um, there, I just wouldn't mind a bit more information around the existing access. How long has that access not been in use? Um, I, I fully accept that the response from the statutory consultees, but I just wouldn't mind a bit more information around um, the the access um, and and how long that access has has been has failed to be in use. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Um... Councillor Jackson, uh, so I'll uh, we'll come back to your first question. Um, so let's stick with the agent for now, supposing for the members the opportunity to ask questions. So uh, again, um, go on for yourself there, Mark. Okay, thanks for that, and thanks for the question, Councillor Jackson. Uh, just to clarify, in case there's been any confusion, and I don't know if there has been, but the access proposed is on to Broomhill Mews and not on to Lima Valley Road itself. So this is an internal uh, access onto an existing road that obviously then is linked to the Lima Valley Road. So um, I, I wasn't, I, I'm unsure if that, if that helps at all. In respect to the second part of your question, you've asked how long has it been in use? Well, the site itself was formerly brownfield, or the site itself is brownfield land and formerly had a residential dwelling on the site. Now, prior to that building being in situ, there was a development, another residential development that would be where the current Broomhill Hotel sits. So over a, an extended period of time, there has been an access at that point, albeit, the access that now leads on to Brimhill Mews has not been in use, given that there's not been a development on that particular piece of land in recent years. So if you want to go back to when the last time it was used, um, it's a difficult question to answer because the development at Brimhill Mews, which comprises of 16 units, when that was delivered, that uh, created what is now the Broomhill Mews Road that we're seeking to utilize. So DFI Roads have looked at this on numerous occasions at the request of objectors, and they've categorically stated that there are no concerns as long as the planning conditions are attached to the permission and implemented. Thank you, Mark. Okay with that, Professor Jackson, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I appreciate it. It was a difficult question to answer, um, but it was it was just trying to establish how long the the, the access wasn't in use. Um, but um no, thanks for the answer. Okay. Um 
just in relation to your other question to myself or the, the, uh, the, the, the planning team here, if it's not in front of me that there are objectors looking to speak, and I work on the, the presumption that there are no objectors wishing to speak, I'm pretty sure that's what's happened. So I'm getting that assurance. I, I can get that verbalized for you, but I'm fairly sure if there are no objectors on our, our agenda, it's because they haven't come forward to speak. Would that be correct, Murray? Yes. Yeah, that's correct, members. So, um, any other questions for Mr. McGaver? Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor McKinney. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. McGaver, for coming in. Um, really, it's just really on the access road again there. Uh, I'm looking at a figure here, and I'm assuming that when they actually come away from the dwelling, they would turn left out on the broom. Broomhill Mews and then straight up on the Limit Valley Road and actually wouldn't be going in front of the other houses on Broomhill Mews, would that be correct? That's correct. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Um, any other questions for the agent members? Anybody online? Okay. Um, Mark? Please do stay with us. I'm uh, going to direct it now over to uh, our planning officer here. So members, again, open it up to yourselves. Any further uh, inquiries or queries for um, Maliki? Nobody in the room and nobody online. Okay, members, there's a recommendation in front of you all here. Recommendation is to approve. Uh, so again, I'll open that up to the floor. Mr. Jackson. Thanks, Chair. Um, and uh, the reason why I, I was asking, because there had been various applications that came before this committee around um, housing developments along the Lamavari Road or in close proximity to Lamavari Road, and we've we've quite often had um, representation from objectors or those that are concerned around uh, the cumulative impact of development along the, the Lamavari Road. Um, so I, I have anticipated um, that that there would be would be people here um, they voice those concerns, and they're concerns that 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 I would share. But um, in relation to this application, um, I, I I note the comments from from the FA roads, and that and and I, from a personal perspective, I don't see any. Um, refusal reason on the basis of access um, that could be sustained. So on that basis, I'm happy to propose that we accept the recommendation. Thanks. Sure. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Um, uh, Councillor McKinney. Uh, Chair, sure, I'd like to second that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor McKinney. Um, if my memory serves me right, I, I, don't, I didn't see any objections that, that may well have referenced the cumulative effect on the Lima Valley Road. It is, as we know, one property. Um, but anyway, thanks for that, uh, members. So, members, again, uh, we have... Uh, oh, we, we, do you know what, members? I'm not sure when Councillor Thompson came in uh, on the chat box. So, Councillor Thompson, I'll afford you the opportunity to come in before we uh, progress. That's only fair. Go ahead, uh, Alderman Thompson. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, uh, I was I was just going to come in to, to second the proposal as well. I know the area very well, not living too far from it, and 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 the the um, there's been no objections from the statutory consultees, and and I accept that, and I think that's the first house going down into the uh, the Brimhill Mews. So I have no objections to that at all, and I'm happy enough with the proposal, and would have been willing to to. Uh, uh, seconded but it's um already been done so thanks very much chair okay and apologies um uh, alderman thompson i just that's I'm, I'm trying to keep i would need three or four you need a bag of eyes on here sometimes to see everything that's going on but anyway uh, uh noted uh, and appreciate that to alderman uh, thompson we have a we have a proposer we do have a seconder uh councillor jackson and councillor mooney uh and again i'm just gonna uh, record the vote oh sorry i'm terribly sorry Councillor McKinney, you are our seconder, and now I'm going to record the vote. Thank you, Chair. Right Members, this is item three, and um, we've got a proposal to accept officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin. Board, Moira. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. 
Keith Kerrigan. And come back. Alderman Drew Thompson. Or. Thank you. Councillor Jason Barr. Or. Or. Thank you. Councillor Raymond Barr. Or. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Or. Thank you. Angela Dobbins, his apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Or. Or. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Thank you. Councillor Patricia Logue. Thank you. Councillor Kieran McGuire. Or. Thank you. Councillor Philip McKinney. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. Thank you. Two Thank votes. you, members. That's uh, unanimous. Um, I'm sorry. I'll go back to Keith. Oh, we need to come back to Keith to see if he's still with us. Oh, he's on well, the chat I'm box. There. I do have it on the chat box as well, Mark. In the chat box. Thank you. Thanks, Thank for you, her. Keith. Uh, Thanks. Thank you, Alderman. Okay, that is now unanimous, members. Okay. As I said, I'm going to bring a bag of A's with me the next time so you can see exactly what's going on in this room and in this chat box thingy here as well. Um, so again, thank you to um, Mark McGaver. Mark, thanks for coming along uh, this afternoon uh, and making yourself available. Uh, and I'm fairly sure now your applicant will be uh, pleased to see that that has been approved. Thank you. You're welcome. Members, um, our next item is um, agenda item number four. It's um, LA11 forward slash 2021 forward slash 0041 forward slash uh, O. Um, and again, it's a proposed site for detached dwelling and garage and lands between 8 and 10 Tullany Road, Eglinton. Uh, recommendation again is to approve and Suzanne, um, I believe you're going to take us through that one. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, this is item number four, um, LA 11 2021 and it's an outline application, single house in the countryside. Um, in front of you is the location map on the left submitted with the planning application and the photo on the right is taken from the access uh, just in the lane to the southwest corner uh, between number 10 and the site. Uh, this lane actually accesses number 10A, which sits behind number 10 Tullany Road. Um, the next slide here is a block plan that the agent has put in in terms of um, indicative siting. Um, you can see the existing building number 10 and 10A Tullany Road to the south and then the start of a number of agricultural sheds which also sit adjacent to the road. In terms of consultation responses, NI Water have no objections. Environmental Health have provided general advice on the proximity to farm sheds um, and the septic tank. Um, in terms of DFI roads, two displays uh, of 2 by 48 are required. Um, and a forward site distance of 48 metres, all achievable. Um, and NIA are content with the preliminary ecological assessment. You'll see from your report, the reason why the application is in front of you today is because there's been more than five objections received. Uh, we've actually had 16 objections from 10 individual objectors with a range of issues. Um, issues around road safety, um, sort of the, the intensity of traffic on the road, visibility, natural heritage issues, need for an environmental impact assessment, the issues of discharge of septic tanks, the level of available services and utilities available, um, overdevelopment in the area, detracting from the rural setting and uh, impacting on the rural setting, peace and quiet offered by once tranquil rural setting. So in terms of the policy framework, it's listed in your reports as is the planning history um, within the area. Um, so looking at the actual planning assessment of the application, um, so the proposal, the site does actually um, would create ribbon development and under CTY8 you will obviously be aware that there is an exception for the infilling of a, of a small gap site. Um, officers consider that this would constitute a small gap site um, as it forms part of a substantial and continuously built up frontage. Um, that is taken into consideration number 10, Tullany Road, um, and the two roadside farm sheds in the northeast. Um, the site doesn't represent a visual break that would preserve rural character, so it's not something that we'd be wanting to say that, you know, um, 
it should stay as it is. Um, and having a dwelling on this site, officers consider would not be detrimental to rural character by reason of ribbon and build up, um, given the enclosed nature of the of the frontage. In terms of CTY 13, officers consider it does provide satisfactory integration. New planting will be required behind the visibility displays. Um, there's a number of existing um, groupings of vegetation along the, the rear boundaries, which provides satisfactory enclosure. And in terms of CTY 16, um, obviously there's a water rack consent required for the septic tank uh, and the access is in accordance with PPS 3. So members, looking at everything in the round and taking on board the, the objections which have been considered in detail in your report, which we've also forwarded to DFI Roads um, on those issues in terms of road safety, um, officers have recommended approval on balance. We feel the site does uh, constitute an infill opportunity and should be approved. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Suzanne. Um, And again, members, uh, we do have uh, the agent online uh, with us this afternoon, uh, Andy Tate. So, Andy, uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, I don't see your image on the screen, but I'm, I'm working on the assumption that you are with us. Um, here, Chair. That's grand. Okay, Andy, you know the drill, of course. Um, I'll give you five minutes to address the committee in relation to this. If you so wish to take the five minutes, of course, and then I'll direct it for uh, questions to yourself. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, well, Judy, uh, Suzanne's comprehensive report there. Um, I've nothing really to add, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So that's why I'm, I'm online today. Thanks, Andy. Okay, short and sweet enough from uh, Mr. Tate. Over to yourselves, because does anybody have any questions for the agent on behalf of the applicant? Nope. Uh, Alderman Kerrigan. Chair, very briefly, and to be fair, more just for the sake of, of asking Andy some, because I, I, I do believe Suzanne's covered most of it and it's been addressed. Um, Andy, normal run of the mill, this wouldn't have come in. This would have been delegated, but it just it's on along the lines of the objections. But you're content enough, and, and I see Suzanne's obviously content enough as well, that, that any of the issues raised by the objectors have been addressed and there's there's no underlying reasons in your view here or any of these objections that can stand up to any any scrutiny in that regard. So just just confirmation of that. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thanks, Keith, for your question. Um that a lot of the a lot of objections have to do with um the walls for the road, which is not really um entirely to do with our site. Um but uh say roads have um, approved the site so um they don't see they're they're the they're the body to deal with so they have no problem with so um hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Kerrigan. Um one further question from uh, Councillor Philip McKinney. Andy, uh that Tolony Road is a dead end, isn't it? And it's only really a lane really that services uh, a few houses and a farm. Would it be correct in saying that? Go ahead, Andy. Yes, Philip. It's um, it's a, as far as it runs to the dead end. Um, I've never actually been to the top of it. Um, I've just went to the site. Um, but there's very little traffic on the road anytime I've been up. It's I've never met any any cars or anything. And there's there's loads of passing bays on it as well. So, um, hope that helps. Want to come back in again? I want to make a recommendation. No, no. Uh, we can't just get there. We haven't got to there just yet. Now. Um, any further questions for Mr. Tate? Okay, don't see any online either, uh, Andy. So, um, just bear with us now. Uh, and again, uh, are there any uh, questions for Suzanne? And if there aren't, clearly in front of you, members, if there are no questions, then there's a recommendation to uh, approve, uh, and I'll pass it over to the floor. I would like to propose, Chair, that we accept the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor McKinney. Uh, we have a seconder. I'll second. Well, thank thank you, uh, Alderman Kerrigan. I had a seconder in the room. Councillor Logue uh, has seconded. Um, so again, thank you. So proposed by Councillor McKinney, seconded by Councillor Logue. 
Members, we'll just record that vote again. Sorry, Chair, you're a bit fast for me today. We <laughs> vote and cheats out. Thank you. That makes a change, Maura. <laughs> yes. Okay, members, this is item four. And this is a vote for um, proposal to accept the officer's recommendation to approve. Alderman Alan Breslin. For Maura. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. For Maura. Thanks, Keith. Alderman Drew Thompson. For Mara. Thanks. Councillor Jason Barr. For. Thanks, Jason. Councillor Raymond Barr. For Mara. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. For. Thanks. Apologies for Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Paul Gallagher. For. Thanks. Councillor Christopher Jackson. For. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Thanks. And Councillor Patricia Logue. Or. Thank you. And Councillor Kieran Maguire. Or. Mara. Thanks. Councillor Philip McKinney. Thanks. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. Thanks. It's unanimous, Chair. Thank you, Maura. Uh, again, members, that's unanimous. Um, uh, so, again, Andy, thanks for uh, joining us uh, this afternoon and taking the time out uh, to answer uh, the, that those brief couple of questions, uh, and again, wish you uh, and the applicant well uh, going forward. Okay, Hi, members, you're welcome. Uh, okay, members, uh, item number five in the agenda um, is uh, LA 11 forward slash F. Um, demolition of an exact uh, attached garage, etc., etc., at Kennego Park, Spring Town, uh, uh, in the city. Uh, recommendation here is to refuse. There was a late item, which I give you all the opportunity to read. Uh, and so um, we will move on and the report for us today will be presented again by your busy woman, Suzanne, by yourself. Thanks, Chair. Um, okay, members, item number five, LA 11 2022 and it's the demolition of a garage to be replaced by a two-storey site extension to provide a granny flat accommodation and the erection of a two-storey garage at 18 Kinnego Park, Derry. The recommendation is to refuse. The location map, members, is on the left-hand side that was submitted along with the plan application. Um, and you will see then the, just the, the satellite overhead, just giving you a bit of context in terms of the um, character of, of the site and, and its immediately surrounding area. This is number 18, Kinnego Park at the end on the left-hand side, of your, or the first photo on the left-hand side, and you can see there's an existing single-storey garage. The land rises quite uh, steeply up behind it. Um, and then the photo on the right just shows you looking back down Kinnego Park. And this is looking up Kinnego Park, up to basically the, the end of the of the turn the turning head whereby the proposed uh, detached garage is located. And again, just another photo on the right giving you more side context um, and the immediately adjacent dwellings. Garden right at the back. Um, and just the current area of hard stand into the side of the house. So, um, in terms of the actual uh, consideration and the application, uh, you've seen in the reports, obviously, the um, policy context is listed, dairy area plan, the SPPS, and then there is obviously separate policy context within e P the PPS 7 addendum on house extensions um, and ancillary accommodation, and then obviously we've considered PPS 3. Um, in terms of the consultee responses, only really road service relevant. Um, they've advised that um, TAS approval is required for um, the retaining wall. Um, and then obviously they've, they've sought and achieved three car parking spaces for the proposal. So looking at the actual proposal in a bit more detail, you'll have seen it in your, in your drawings and your reports. If we go to the actually the, the photo on the right hand side, that's the proposed front elevation. So it is a two-story extension 
um, it's got separate access and then um, you'll see that the garage is proposed detached at the top of the turning head. You can see it at the block plan. Garage is proposed to drive in, obviously, um, facing, the dwell facing the dwelling. Um, the development itself, in the ground floor is proposing um, a, sh a separate access, but it is also proposing an uh, internal connection door, um, two ground floor bedrooms, a bathroom out the back, some storage, and then a separate staircase upstairs to a kitchen, living, dining area, and then a separate living area overlooking the garden um, with double doors out onto the garden area. Um, and obviously there's no link here in terms of the upstairs um, accommodation at all to the existing dwelling. So I suppose the issue you'll have gathered members from the report is the fact that um, in providing ancillary accommodation, um, it's, it's recommended and, and the guidance advises that there should be, you know, that the new proposal should be supplementary um, and reliant on the main dwelling. Um, and whilst we're aware that um, you know, some circumstances have been provided um, by the applicant and the agent in terms of, of the requirement of this. That alone, we feel, is not sufficient. Uh, what we would be looking for here is a more integral development um, extension. And obviously, you'll be aware of the report as well. Back in 1999, there was a two-storey site extension approved on this house with a detached small-scale garage. Um, but what we're looking here now is is ancillary accommodation, and they're, 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 you know the the plans need to show more dependence on the main dwelling to allow us to recommend this for approval. Um, the case officer had um, considered these matters with the agent. The agent in the late information clearly advises that. Um, for a number of reasons, both personal circumstances and also other histories that they have got approved in the district, they feel that they felt that it, it they didn't want to change the application um, and they wanted it determined as it was. So that's obviously the recommendation we've came to today. In terms of those existing um, histories, um, what I would say is, you know, the, the context is slightly different. Both are the conversion of existing garages, both on large detached dwellings um, within the cartilage of the site. Um, and so there's there's a different planning context there, essentially, is what, what, what as officers, what we'd be saying. So. In summary, really, um, in terms of recommend and refusal, um, we feel that is it is um, doesn't meet the policy in terms of ancillary accommodation. Uh, we would be re recommending that you know, in the absence of any amended plan plans, um, you know, incorporating a, a more reduced integral layout of the ancillary accommodation um, that refusals recommended. Members, thank you. Thank you, uh, Suzanne. Again, thank, uh, thanks to yourself and, and, and the team for uh, preparing that report for us. Uh, members, we do have uh, online uh, a further speaker, uh, the, um, the agent supporting uh, the applicant here, uh, Kevin Strathairn. Um, uh, Kevin, you're very welcome. And again, thank you uh, for uh, uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, before uh, I invite you to speak, uh, Kevin, we're conscious of the fact that you forwarded um, a late item, which you may well deem to be personal information uh, uh, in reference to the applicant that might best not be shared in a, in a public forum. Uh, if that were the case, then it would be acceptable to me um, that some element of your presentation could be heard in, uh, in private business here, if you feel that you would like to um, expound further on on the late item that you gave us. Um, uh, I suppose it's uh, you can maybe consider it like a GDPR type um, um, situation, but it's entirely up to yourself. But I would caution that you know, obviously, we're we're in possession of somebody's personal uh, information here, uh, and so I leave that open to yourself for now. And again, I'm sure members will be cognizant of that as well. And should members request that they want to discuss the late item. Uh, in, in a confidential manner, then we can do that too. Okay, so again, uh, Kevin, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, I'll afford you five minutes to uh, address the committee uh, as you see fit, um, uh, and then we'll open it up to them for questions to yourself. So um, over to yourself, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Chair. I assume you can hear me? 
we are reading you loud and clear. Thank you. Um, and with reference to your first point uh, or your point there about the confidential information, all I can say is I've shared this document and the document that we give to you to the client, and he was happy that it was um, that it was given to the planning committee. So, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, re to represent my client in this application. And uh, I first want to start off by saying that there was a plan, and, and I'm glad that the planning officer has brought it up, but I don't see it in the report, but there was a plan and approval granted for an extension to this house and a detached garage uh, previously, but it has been missed from the, I think it's section seven of the report. But, and I think that's very relevant and we'll speak about that later. My client suffers mobility issues uh, following the removal of a lower limb. And he, he needs a certain amount of help with his daily life, but he's still a very proud man and he wants to keep his independence. And at the minute he has given the main house at 18 Kinnegal Park to his daughter, but he proposes to live in a granny flat as part of his long term future. And when we designed the granny flat with the client, he was quite insistent on the design. And it's, I suppose, I suppose he, he wants supervision and assistance, but he also requires a certain amount of independence. And he is a keen gardener and a keen DOI enthusiast. And the elements of the garage were, were, were to, to, to tie in with these DIY enthusiast. I don't even believe he'll ever have a car parked in it, but he wanted it somewhere for himself to, to, to tinker away with his, with his hobby. Um, and as far as I can establish from the planning report, the, the refusal was based on two elements. The granny fat in its current floor was too large and it wasn't connected to the, to the main house. And that the detached garage was deemed intrusive in, in the streetscape. And I want to look at the two of them in two separate items, but at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll pull them back into one. And if we look at the granny flat first, I think if you, anybody reads the, the report, the case officer does state that, the, and I, I'm quoting here, the physical scale, form and massing of this structure would be subservient and integrate well with the host buildings. So the report accepts that our design is correct in terms of the built form and it complies at scale massing, but the issues that the planning service seem to be proposing is that it's excessive and that there's no internal connections or internal links with the building. I don't believe that the granite flat and the scale of it's excessive. It's only 64 square meters. And I don't believe this is excessive by any means. And we had proposed, as the officer talked there, that it's two bedrooms plus a shower room on the ground floor and a kitchen living dining room on the first floor. And during the planning process, the case officer asked me why two bedrooms? And I think Anybody has the right to have two bedrooms in a granny flat. And we have produced numerous granny flats that all had two bedrooms. And in this particular case, the client has a son who lives in England. And the son visits him and wants needs somewhere to stay. But also in the future, maybe the son will actually come home to stay with them and allow a, a bit of assistance in, 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 in looking after him. And the other issue that the planners have with with the granny flat was the connection. And this is connected on the ground floor. And as I said in the opening statement, the client needs supervision, but he also wants privacy. And he wants privacy that his daughter will be able to access the house to check up on him, but he still is an independent man and he still will live his own life until a certain point where he's not able to live his own life. So there is there is a, a physical connection and there is shared spaces in terms of the external external uh, garden space. And one other point that uh, the case offer mentioned, and I only used it as an example of the size, which which I was told during the plan application that this was way too large and that we had to make it smaller. We we have done numerous granny flats, and one in particular that I had 
I, I had received approval in 2018. And it, as I said, this granny flat is 64 square meters. And the one in 2018 was 189 square meters, which is 125 square meters larger than this proposal. And I don't believe that it, it, it can be deemed deemed excessive. The second point is the detached garage. And as, as I pointed out before, there already was a detached garage approved in this site. And I have the planning reference here if anybody wants it. And but with the, point 11 of the report states, and I'm quoting again, when compared to the existing built form of the streets, it is considered that the introduction of a detached garage would be very visually intrusive in the streetscape. Over dominate the front of the property and out of keeping with the appearance and character of the host building and this domestic scale street. Again, I don't agree with that. And for a number of reasons, one, there already was a garage approved on the site in this same location. And if we look at the drawings, the garage is 10 meters away from the facade of the main building. So it won't have any effect on overbearing on or over dominant, I think was the word, on on on, on the front of the property. Excuse okay. me, Mr. Stathlin, sorry, but your five minutes uh, speaking rights is now complete. Can I just conclude then? I, I will afford you the opportunity to conclude. I'm not an unfair man, so uh, <laughs> Thank uh, you very go, much. Ahead, go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> In, in conclusion, we do not believe that the application should be refused. We do not believe that it is contrary to planning policy PPA 7. We feel that the scale and massing is considered sympathetic to the existing building form. The planning officer accepted this in his statement point 11a. And because it's at the end of a row, we believe that it will not detract, detract from the appearance and character of the surrounding areas. The planning officer also accepts that this report that does not unduly affect the privacy or the amenity of neighboring residents, C.11, nor will the proposal cause the unacceptable loss of damage of trees, C.11 C. Road service are happy with the proposal. All neighboring objections have been resolved through considered redesign during the planning pro process. And we do not believe that it's excessive in size. And we, we're, we feel that this application should be approved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, and um, thanks for concluding um, uh, in, a, in a timely manner as well. I, I always appreciate the uh, cooperation from, from agents and applicants uh, in, in that manner. Um, so stick with us, Kevin. Uh, uh, we have a uh, member's opportunity here now to um, uh, put some questions to you. So members, again, I'll open it up to you. Do any of you have any questions for Mr. Strasser? Councillor Jackson. Thanks, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Kevin. I suppose just a very brief question. Um, in respect to the previous approval, um, can you elaborate a bit more on that? Because there, there hasn't. It, it, it was, it was new to me, and I actually felt that the, the officer must spoke because I, I knew that the, the site, the relevant site history, um, outlined to the previous refusal. So I just wouldn't mind some more information around what was previously approved on the site. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Jackson. It's probably a question for the officers as well. I'm sure um, you'll come back to that if uh, if you don't, I will. But Kevin, uh, in your view, what 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 was the previous approval? Yes, uh, <clears throat> Kevin, you right, may sorry, be telling us, but we're not hearing you, so you're sorry. Right. Sorry, you're right. Right. Yeah, go, go for it again. Go um, for it again. Basically, I try to find the the drawings of the approval on the planning website, but because it's so old, it, I wasn't able to get it. And I actually asked the planning officer to see if he could find it, you know, in, in, in files, but we didn't get it. But this is information that I got from my client. He, he, this was his family home. And he had a number of children and the, he applied for a two story full extension to the side. Of similar to what we are proposing here and the detached garage. Similar size and location is what we're proposing here. 
And as I say, that's secondhand information, so I can't confirm it. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Uh, you can tell with that, Christopher. Yeah. Any other questions for Mr. Strathairn? Sure. Councillor Gallagher, go ahead. I know you need a bag of like, but um, it doesn't. <laughs> actually, I saw. I actually saw that one. Would you believe, Paul? So go ahead. Just a question for Kevin, just on, on regards, you know, at Granny Flat and all the rest, right? And, and there's two bedrooms in the plan. Uh, just a question around, and I know you sent extra information. Would that be either now or in the future, the second bedroom being for a care? Would that be like a sort of forward planning of, on the potential in the future? Yeah, that would be the, exactly the case, you know, and, uh, you know, as I say, this this man suffers mobility issues now, but in 10 years, 15 years and 20 years, we he doesn't know where he'll be. So, yes, that would be, you know, uh, considered a care. And I, I, I would just want to point out something that was actually mentioned to me as well about the layout of this 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 building. And it's an upside down house, but it's upside down for the reason because of the shape of the site the way the ground rises up for to get the best light until until the until the living room space and give access to the garden it was it was the best possibility to put the living room on the first floor level you know okay you can tell with that councillor geller thank you thank you paul thank you any other questions members okay I have no further questions from the members for you here, Kevin, um, but stick with us. Uh, I'm going to direct uh, uh, back now to... So, sorry, uh, Jeff, just, sorry, just one more, because I'm just seeing it. Sorry, go ahead, Paul, go ahead. Just just regarding, you know, the integrating with the other building, the existing home, and 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 the, our officers, you know, sort of and, and talking with the agent, was was there any discussion you know of around sort of trying to open up more with connection of rooms that would integrate the new extension was there was there like a i know you talked about being independent but was there a resistance to like maybe having it more integrated with the other existing well well i suppose I suppose there's two factors here. There's one, the factor that he, my client, has given the main house to his daughter and her family. So that is her family home now. And she is accepting the concept of, of the granny flat attached to the home. So I, I suppose, to, and they're quite a small property, so it's not, it's not as if we have great room and corridors and space to make links and connections. And if you made a connection from one other than the connection that we've shown on the ground floor, you're going to affect a bedroom. You're going to affect a bathroom. You're going to lose a bedroom in the main house. Um, so I feel architecturally that that was the only solution with the layout because of the living space being on the ground, on the first floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, Kevin, there actually is a door in from the, the ground there floor. Is a, there is. There's a, yes. I mean, some, sometimes looking at the plans that we have, they're quite small. They're not the full blown plan that an officer would be looking at. But as far as I can see here, there is a door between the proposed extension and the ground floor uh, of the um, of the dwelling as it is at the moment. Isn't that correct? Yes, it, yeah. that is correct. That is correct. And the, one of the things that actually works quite well because my client's problem is, it sounds too much, but getting out of bed in the morning and, and it allows his daughter to come down and get in and in the future and, and, and see, you know, where he's at and get him up for the day, you know, and that's that's why it does work at the ground floor level. Okay, that's grand. Kevin, that answers, I suppose that answered my question in association with um, Councillor Gallagher's question. Um, okay, members, any other questions before I pass over to questions for the officer? Okay, right. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Stick with us. Uh, I'm going to pass it over now to um, questions for the officers, uh, members. Back to yourselves. Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I tell you, I'm actually reading the PPS seven here. The odd, 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 excuse me, Odom, Odom, and uh, two points. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Thank you for that. And, uh, and uh, two point seven here states, um, if I may quote it, the department will give sympathetic consideration to proposals where an extension or alteration is required for a person with a disability or whose mobility is otherwise impaired. And it goes on down to say. The specific needs of a person with disability are, however, very important in material consideration, and exceptional exception to the policy criteria may be relaxed to meet these needs. Is there a question on that? Um, you want that? Sorry, sorry, it's more of a statement. Sorry, more of a statement. Right, okay. More of a statement. All right. Um, uh, okay. Any other questions? I'll take the odd statement, like, if you keep them short, like, you know, but uh, go ahead, Councillor Jackson. Chair, no, and, and just um, picking up on the, the point um, from Councillor McKinney, um, was, that, was that exception within the policy considered? And again, going back to the, 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 the previous question in relation to the previous plan in history, um, how much weight did officers place on the previous approval that was on the site? Okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, first of all, what I would clarify, members, is apologies. The original approval was not contained within your reports. I today have found the original plans, which I think Kevin hasn't got and we couldn't find until today either. So there was an original, and I've actually just taken a photo and tried to put them up there, but they're not very clear. There was an original approval for a two-storey extension, okay, um, but it was an extension to the dwelling, okay, and there was a small detached garage back in 1999, okay. The current policy now came out in 2008, okay, and it specifically goes further and addresses issues like the position of detached buildings and garages, which wouldn't have been addressed in the original um, previous policy um, that we would have been looking at. So that is, I suppose, in terms of the starting point here, yes, there's flexibility within the addendum for people with disabilities, and we have considered that, but what we are saying is, look, the the the, co the accommodation, you know, if it's for disability issues, and it, it's it has to be practical, you know, why is the living room upstairs? Why is the kitchen upstairs? Um, there, there's no issue here with with the the provision of an extension, right? What we're looking at here is is uh, we feel that the plans could be amended to show um, the property or the extension being more integral. And I will refer you members to and, and the agent to um, A4 and Annex 4 of the, the addendum. So your policy text of EXT1 tells you about this. And Kevin is right, yes. Visually, this looks okay, right? Um, but the guidance set out in Annex A is also taken into account, and that's within the policy text. And A4 tells you that an extension or alteration to a residential property should be designed and become an integral part of a property, both functionally and visually. So, you know, all is, all we're trying to do here as officers is to ensure that the, this this ancillary accommodation is as required, um, that it's that it's more functionally dependent on the existing property. And it's not what, what Kevin is saying here, that, you know, Clearly, the building is going to be occupied by the, the gentleman's daughter, um, and this is really a separate unit of accommodation, um, albeit relatively, um, you know, two, two bedrooms. And nobody's disputing the fact of two bedrooms required for anybody who requires ancillary accommodation. We get lots of applications in all the time whereby there's carers, two bedrooms are required for carers. That is not something that we are not uh, aware of. So we're really on, but this is really the principle of it. In terms of the issue with the garage, it's clearly set out in paragraph A11, and this was not a consideration, as as, the, as I said, with the original approval, you know, that there should be care uh, in terms of site in these buildings. So, I mean, this is relatively, it's a single garage, it's almost six metres high. Um, I appreciate upstairs is for storage, um, but I mean, we're looking at, at quite an urban context, um, and, you know, it's not something that we feel, you know, maybe it could be reduced in scale, um, a, a sort of a, a, a resolution here, but looking at what we have been provided with, um, um, that's the decision, the recommendation that we have made on that. Happy to clarify any further questions. Thanks, Suzanne. Okay, members, any other questions? 
to Suzanne. Okay, so Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose I have a couple of questions. One is on the accommodation, and, and you're mentioning the, the policy from 2008. I know. I suppose there's been a lot of progress in technology since that time, and I'm not sure that you always need a design solution uh, if you've got an intercom or you've got some way of communicating with the people in the main part of the house. So has that been given any sort of consideration in terms of, you know, the connectivity that exists between both parts? And um, because it's not just the physical uh, fact of doors, you know, at every level or several doors through the walls that it actually you can communicate with, you know, beyond having to walk through a door that you can pick up an intercom or a phone even. Uh, and the other one is in terms of, of the overbearing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the photographs and I'm, I'm not persuaded because of the, the impact of number two and number four on the height behind um, on the, the next road over, because it sits right up in the skyline and I find that more overbearing than where the garage would be. I also find the Leyland I hedge a, a far more overbearing factor on that whole streetscape uh, than than the um, than the proposed applicant uh, the application for the the garage. So just wonder if you say a wee bit more about just in the overbearing aspect of that. Um, well, in terms of the overbearing, I suppose really you know it's really the issues to do with the the, the scale of the detached garage. Okay, which um, is what I've been saying is we feel it's contrary to PPS seven the addendum which clearly refers to, um, you know, buildings not coming out into the streetscape like that. Uh, in terms of the, I mean, I note your, you know, I accept your points in relation to your views on the overbearing. In relation to the communication issue, I mean, the policy is designed, the policy sets out very, very clearly that the whole reasoning behind um, or the whole ethos, I suppose, if you want to call it that, behind ancillary accommodation is that it's not a separate unit of accommodation. There's no issue of, you know, we wouldn't be um, applying the fact that's, you know, um, an intercom. This this is to do, this is to ensure that um, it doesn't it operate as a separate unit. And, and that is that is an objective of the policy. Um, now, um, going forward, so, I mean, that that's the policy that's in front of us. And that's what we've assessed it against. But in terms of the exception within the policy, is there any consideration given to that? No. We have considered the information that has come forward in terms of the mobility issues, right? Um, and what I've said is that we have no objection to the provision of, of accommodation here. It's the functionality of the design that's being proposed. We feel that that I mean, I, I feel that um, we would be straying down very difficult precedents if we were looking at approving, um, you know, ancillary accommodation um, so separate at the moment. And in terms of the practical layout, I would bring it back to that. I mean, the issues being presented here are mobility issues, but we have you know, upper floor accommodation. Normally we would be receiving applications whereby it's all very level access. And I appreciate that maybe can't be provided on part of the site given the the topography of the back, but in the round, that's the recommendation that we've come to. Okay, Dan, you're right with that. Do you want to come back on? Just to point out, Chair, I, I am persuaded by the argument because there is no there's no way this can stand as a separate functioning house or could even be blocked up in terms of the connection between the two buildings and survive as a separate block because the light into the bedroom is I mean they're they're obviously accepting a, a far lesser standard of light coming in that would normally be accepted um, for a standalone building into the bedroom space but that's because they're going to be in there at night and they can they can live with that um, so the, the living space during the day is upstairs where they're going to get the light during the day and you know and, and we talk about things like mental health at council all the time. Daylight, you know, being out or, or being indoors if it's wet um, and you can't get out with mobility issues. I mean, it's sitting indoors in, in a, if you were downstairs in a dark house would be appalling, uh, you know. So I am persuaded by the argument that in terms of the broad brushstrokes of, of health, not just the, the, the disability aspect of it, but in terms of mental health and everything else, 
you, you do want to have light in, in the space in your living in, um, but they're prepared to accept, you know, that that's going to impact on their on their bedroom space and their bathroom space because there's going to be no light uh, looking at that. Uh, those those levels, there's going to be very little, maybe no lights too too strong, but there's going to be very little natural daylight coming in to those ground floor um, spaces. So I, I think, you know, in the round, I, I think there, I don't think you can take, I don't think I'm persuaded that you can say that house would survive on its own. I think it, it, it only stands ancillary to the main structure when you consider those issues. Okay. I don't think you're looking for a, a comment on that, you know. I mean, but that's, a, you know, it's an observation, and I think it's an observation you're making because obviously you want other members of the committee to consider that as an idea as well, Dan. And I don't think it's an unreasonable observation either. Uh, in fairness, uh, I don't want to be going directing people yet um, uh, and, and telling you what I think. But um, has anybody else got any other questions for Suzanne? No. None in, the, none in the chat box and none in here. Well, members, look, as I said, I always try and reserve my own uh, questions till the end if I can. Um, and the original proposal, clearly, Suzanne, that was news to all of us. Uh, and I'm glad that we, we had the opportunity to look at that. And as from what I can tell, and I mean, obviously, it's you've done your best in trying to take a photograph of, of it. Um, uh, the garage that was proposed then is in the exact same location uh, as this particular garage. I think perhaps the only difference is the height of the garage. You did mention that this one is six, did you say six metres? It's just under six metres, the proposed one, and the original one was, was just a very modest single garage. And just to clarify members as well, it's not very clear, apologies, but there was uh, upstairs one master bedroom um, and en suite and downstairs was a sitting room and a utility room. Okay, right. So that's that's referenced the 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 previous um, proposal that had been approved as an extension of the house. I think is what you said as well. Um, for me, it's still it's still relevant in some senses. Um, Councillor Kelly, you actually mentioned the Leylandi that are that you see there in that picture. They were the bane of my life at one point, those lay land day, because you can see uh, I used to represent that area and they are very, very tall. Um, but they are they've been as tall as that as far as I can remember going back in the Morium anyway, you know. So you'd kind of think that they would be chopped at some point. And that might be a fair that may be a consideration for future as well. Um uh but I I, I take the point that the Councillor Kelly made as well. Um, you know, we're we're looking for practical solutions for living conditions for people and planning as, as much as uh, as anything else. And, uh, and you know, the topography of, of the back garden area uh, affords very little in the way of, of usage for somebody with a, a disability, uh, uh, such as that outlined. And I can see the logic of providing an eagle ease of access onto that upper garden area. And, you know, Councillor Kelly, you make a very good point. Quality of life. Uh, and quality of living is something that I think we all should be bearing in mind as we go forward as well. So then I, 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 my question was literally just about the garage and the height of the garage. It does, it is something that I think, um, looks inordinately high in that position. Um, but I'll, I'll think about it and I'll consider it. Um, uh, for now, does anybody have any other questions? No. Just give me a second. Okay, members, we'll look here. There's a, there's a, have you got another question? There's a Kelly, go ahead. Is there, Chair, a streetscape view with uh, the, I suppose the garage set in as a what, you know, what it would look like if it was sitting in the streetscape? Is there such a sketch? I know it's not on the pack, anyway. Um, Thank you. 
if it's if it's of any help to you, I think photo three. Um, and see, I know this street well enough. I've, I've been up and down it over the years. Um, so photo three, the garage would be sitting at the ver at the very direct top of the street on the right hand side, uh, underneath where the the tall Leilani are. If that is in any way helpful, Dan. Yeah, just to clarify, Chair, there's there's no contextual drawing of, of that elevation, Councillor Kelly, just there, the photo on the left. That's what I think you're looking for. I would be directly behind the Leylandi, as they are now. As you know yourself, trees get chopped, but that's where they, that's what the situation is, as, as we're looking at now. Okay, members, um, let's just give it a pause there to see if there's any consider further consideration or any other questions. If not, um, there is, of course, a recommendation in front of us here for uh, this particular application. And the recommendation is currently to refuse members. So uh, uh, I'll uh, ask for direction from your, yourselves in relation to if that's acceptable to you or if indeed you have any further proposals that uh, you might wish to put forward. I hate to pressure you, uh, members, but as I said, we do have a proposal on the floor. Uh, it's a recommendation to refuse. If that's not a recommendation being put forward, then I'll have to hear something different. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Chair. Um, and uh, listening to reading the report and listening to um, everybody's contributions, the 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 recommendation that's coming before this committee isn't something that I would feel comfortable. Um, I fully um, understand the the, the comment. Um, that Suzanne made in, in relation to setting an undesirable precedent around um, the granny flat type um, proposals or applications. But we look at each application and it's um, on its own merits. And Councillor Kelly um, referred to the, the, the overall landscape, the, the, the two housing, houses um, that is sitting behind the, the proposed garage, um, the, the land agent, um, which um, is, has a, a dominant impact uh, on that streetscape. So I, I find it very difficult to see how this application um, would have a dominant impact and and that it would it would somehow detract from from the established character of the area, um, that's that, that's something that I, I just haven't been convinced of. And in in relation to the the ancillary nature nature of of the the proposal, um, I I feel that it that 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 it wouldn't be um, contra contrary to the PPS seven um, addendum and in respect the 
it, it has been demonstrated that the applicant, for very personal reasons, um, needs assistance in the here and now. Um, they, in, in the mornings they get up, this this proposal um, allows, uh, allows that to be accommodated while still retaining some level of independence. Councillor Kelly again outlined um, uh, you know, different reasons around how this application or this, this development wouldn't be, um, c couldn't, couldn't be a standalone application. It is, it is dependent on the main building, and I, I've I've been convinced by by that those arguments. Um, we've we've heard around how the building's been carefully designed to meet the individual needs of of not only the applicant but the applicant and his uh, and his daughter. Um, so. I, I I believe that it it should it, that we should approve the application and propose that we we approve the application, um, taking into consideration the the exceptional um, clause within the policy. Um, I'll put that to the floor, Chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Jackson. Up to second, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Gallagher. Um, okay, well, uh, we do have a, a proposer and a seconder. Do you want to speak, Councillor McKinney? Yes, please, uh, Chair. Uh, just reference, um, can we have uh, something put in there about reduction of the size of the height of the garage? Any objections? Uh, um, the, unfortunately, and I was going to say, Councillor McKinney, I was going to say that height of that garage is a Pretty much a stumbling block for me as well because, as I said, if you reach, cut down those lay land, I, then that would be overbearing on the houses on the other side of that fence, and that's a big problem that I have with this. Um, but we can't detect, we can't detach that now, Maura. If you want to explain that, so it's it's on the basis of that garage. I suppose members, if officers had revised drawings in front of them with changes and reductions and the things that they had been trying to negotiate, you know, we might not be in that position. So we are unfortunately faced with the proposals that are in front of us and um and and the drawings that are in front of us and we were faced with that um dilemma also. So um making this uh balanced judgment as well. So thank you. Okay. Um well we've got a proposal and we got a we got a seconder um proposed by Councillor Jackson. Bear with me. Um, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Suzanne's just attracted my attention to the fact that there would be a condition attached to this, and I'm going to ask Suzanne if she can okay. explain that to you. Um, so, members, obviously the proposal is, um, could you consider it does comply with the policy. The policy in paragraph 2.11 does state that in all cases uh, where permission is granted to be subject to a condition that the extension will only be used for ancillary residential purposes connected with main dwelling and not as a separate unit of accommodation. So that would be something that we would, um, if members are content, we would attach as a condition. All content with that? Yeah. Um, effectively meaning then, I suppose, Suzanne, that you can't break up the doorway between the two. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, members, proposal from Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Gallagher. Uh, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put it to the floor for a vote now. Um, uh, so, Maura, if you would take us through the vote. Yes, thank you. Members, this is item five in this proposal not to accept the officer's recommendation um, with a potential uh, condition attached relating to um, the non-separation of the unit of accommodation. Um, Alderman Alan Breslin? Against. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan? Alderman Keith Kerrigan? Against, Mara. Thank you. Alderman Drew Thompson? Against, Mara. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jason Barr? 
Thank you. Councillor Raymond Barr. All right, Raymond has left. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. I'm going to abstain on this occasion. Okay. Councillor Anton Dobbins was apologies. And Councillor Paul Gallagher. Four. Um, Councillor Christopher Jackson. Four. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Thank you. Councillor Patricia Logue. It's gone. Oh, no, stepped out. Oh, sorry, that's right. Councillor Keith Kerrigan. Sorry, I did I did vote Mara. Oh, sorry, Councillor Keir Maguire. For Mara. Thank you. Councillor Philip McKinney. For. Thank you. And Councillor Sean Mooney. For. Thank you. Seven for uh, three against one abstention. So um, uh, thank you very much. And uh, can I just again um, thank uh, Kevin Strathairn. Kevin, thank you um, for taking the time to join us this afternoon. And again, wish you well and your applicant uh, going forward with this um, particular application. And of course, um, uh, our officer team are always available for further conversations. Um, members. Uh, we're past the two-hour mark. I'm proposing we take a 10-minute break, uh, and we will come back here. Uh, we could take it to half. Uh, we could. We could take it to half past four. So we'll take it. We'll take it. Uh, it's less than 15 minutes. We'll come back at half four. Okay.
Um, uh, so, um, thanks for everybody joining us again we, uh, after the break. Uh, apologies for the slight delay. Um, however, we are ready to roll again. And the next item on the agenda is the last one for decision today, uh, item number six. Uh, LA 112021 uh, 0628 forward slash O proposed uh, 1.5 story domestic dwelling. Uh, and the recommendation for that is a refusal. And um, Katrina, I believe you're going to walk us through that one. So, whenever you're ready. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, the application is um, for a proposed one and a half story domestic dwelling for uh, family members, how it's been described. And the site is 16 metres southwest of 91 Curly Hill Road, Straban. So um, as you can see here on uh, the site location plan, the application site is located in a rural area approximately two kilometres east of Straban. The site's located on the southern side of Curly Hill Road to the rear of the applicant's dwelling at 91 Curly Hill Road. You can see it there detailed on the photograph. Um, it's set back up a laneway approximately 200 metres from the main road. And the site comprises the rear garden of the applicant's dwelling and a portion of the existing access lane, which currently serves two dwellings on this lane. So the other dwelling is further on up the lane. You can see on the bend there. Um, the access lane rises gently from the road in a southerly direction towards the site and the land within the site sits at a higher level above the applicant's adjoining dwelling and the land within the site rises gently to the west. There are shrubs and trees in the northwest corner of the site, you can see it there in the photograph, and a small open-sided sheet metal stroke plastic shed structure in the northern corner of the site. Uh, the southwest boundary is defined by a two metre high earth grass bank which retains um, the adjoining field to the west uh, with a one metre post and wire fence on the top and trees along the middle part of the boundary. The northwest boundary is defined by a grass bank, some trees along the western part. Uh, the southeast boundary of the rear garden along the laneway is defined by a one metre high timber ranch style fence and three to four metre high conifer trees. Uh, the adjoining bungalow has an attached carport with a detached garage and a prefab structure to the rear along the eastern boundary of the application site. So um, these two photographs here shows the proposed site uh, sort of laid out like a garden area for the, the site or the house to the front. So um, these two photographs show looking down on the application site and from the laneway. So you can see that the site is at a slightly higher level there. So the policy context is as listed here and uh, as detailed in the report. So um, we wrote out uh, to the agent after we received the application because we weren't uh, sure what this would be assessed under. So um, the agent said that the nearest policy that he could think that it would apply under would be um, CTY8. So um, CTY8 uh, of PPS21 states that planning permission will be refused for a building which creates or adds to a ribbon of development. In such circumstances, the policy does permit an exception for the development of a small gap site sufficient only to accommodate up to a maximum of two houses within an otherwise substantial and continuously built up frontage. The proposed dwelling along with the applicant's existing dwelling would not create or add to a ribbon of development along the existing lane. Therefore, the proposal does not engage the exception outlined in policy CTY8. Furthermore, the existing dwelling does not provide a, a, a substantial and continuously built up frontage. The application is not a small gap and there is no development to the southwest end of the site. So this shows um, the context of what they were proposing for the dwelling the proposed site plan. So um, in the P1 form, design and access statement, because this is in the OMB, it advised that the dwelling is intended for the applicant's daughter, who is a non-farming rural dweller who wishes to remain on the countryside on family land. These are not considered compelling and site-specific reasons for the provision of a new dwelling in the countryside under policy C2I6, and no information has been submitted to demonstrate the proposal is to meet the long-term needs of the applicant. Therefore, the proposal does not meet the policy requirements for a new dwelling based on special personal or domestic circumstances under policy C2I6. So if we go back to basics with uh, policy CTY1, 
The proposal does not meet any of the cases in which an individual dwelling will be granted planning permission. Um, it's not cited within an existing cluster to meet CTY2A. Um, it's not a replacement dwelling. Um, it does. It isn't based on, as I just said, their CTY6 special personal or domestic circumstances. It isn't to meet um, uh, a business need for a non-agricultural business. It's not the development of a small gap site, and it's not a dwelling on a farm. So there's no overriding reasons why this development is essential in this rural location. So it's therefore contrary to policy uh, CTY1. So in terms of policy CTY 13, um, there are open and sustained views traveling along Curly Hill Road. A new dwelling, as you've seen in one of the earlier photographs, sits at, the site sits at a higher level. So it's a proposed one and a half storey dwelling. So a new dwelling will sit at a slightly higher level above the applicant's dwelling and be prominent in the landscape. And the new dwelling will not visually integrate into the surrounding landscape. So we view that it's contrary to policy CTY 13. So this is an approach from the south. Um, you can see there the arrow highlighting where the application site is and the building to the front is the applicant's uh, dwelling. So in terms of a PPS3, uh, the development will use the existing access lane onto Curly Hill Road, a 2.4 metre by 75 metre visibility displays and a 75 metre forward site distance are required. These works require a bridge parapet to be set back uh, these works have been detailed on the submitted site plans um, submitted by the agent and DFI roads are content and TAS approval will be required at a reserve matter stage. In terms of PPS 15 plan and flood risk, the extension of the bridge parapet um, culvert is necessary to provide the safe access in accordance with policy FLD floor 4 of PPS 15 and the maintenance strip requested by DFI rivers can be conditioned on a reserve matters. A, a drainage assessment was not um, required. In terms of PPS 2, because of the small drainage ditch to the north of the site, um, the, these watercourses are hydrologically linked to the river foil. So um, we asked for a preliminary ecological assessment. So SES carried out a HRA, which concluded the development would not have an adverse effect on designated sites. Um, both SES and NED are content subject to mitigation conditioned in any planning approval, including the construction, submission of a construction method statement at reserve matter stage. There will be no likely significant effects on designated sites in accordance with policies NH1 and NH3 of PPS2. So in the PEA, there was no, the ecologist found no sign of badgers. Um, there was negligible bat risk potential and trees are to be retained on the site and um, NED were content subject to these being protected during construction works and the development will not adversely impact protected or priority species or habitats in accordance with policies NH3 and NH5. So in terms of other policy considerations, uh, residential amenity, the new dwelling is going to be to the rear of the applicant's dwelling, but privacy, overlooking, noise, etc. can be um, uh, designed out at a reserve matter stage. Um, also, there were six wind turbines approved within one kilometre of the site. So environmental health have advised that noise from these will be heard at the site on occasions. However, cumulative noise is unlikely to breach noise limits. So uh, the proposal will not adversely impact residential amenity in accordance with the SPPS. In terms of representations, there have been no letters of objection or support received. So in summary, the proposal does not meet any of the cases where an individual dwelling would be granted permission under policy CTY1, and there are no overriding reasons why this development is essential in this rural location. So the proposal will be a prominent feature and would not visually integrate into the surrounding landscape. And um, the refusal reasons are detailed in your report, and I just put them up here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Katrina. Um, again, members, we have um, one speaker. Uh, um, well, we potentially got three. Um, so if I could now welcome uh, Mark Houston, who is the agent uh, for the applicants. And I also believe, are the applicants online with us or are they not? Um, okay. Um, Anyway, look, uh, this is not really telling me much, but anyway, we do have Mark Houston. Um, so, uh, Mark, you're very welcome. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. And again, thanks for your patience and waiting for your turn uh, on the agenda this afternoon. Um, 
Uh, I can now afford you five minutes to uh, address the committee, should you so wish uh, to take it, uh, and then I'll open it up for uh, questions. So, Mark, I am going to pass it over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and um, good afternoon, councillors and uh, representatives of the planning service. And thank you for giving us the opportunity today to uh, discuss our application. Uh, this application to the rear of 91 Curly Hill Road uh, was lodged by the applicant in an attempt to secure planning permission for his daughter Emma, who is with us in the meeting here today. And the site, that, as outlined earlier, was within the curtilage of the applicant's existing uh, substantial rear garden, which, in our opinion, is of an ample size to accommodate a modest dwelling without any negative impact on the existing dwelling or neighbouring properties. And the site benefits, uh, again, as was outlined earlier, from having an existing access from an existing laneway currently used by only two dwellings and an agricultural building. Um, if I could just quickly reference the, the full suite of positive responses from all the various statutory consultees, summarised with a few conditions to be imposed upon any approval as follows. Uh, DFI roads, no objections, uh, subject to the works required to the bridge parapet, which have already been outlined. Uh, DFI rubbers agency, no objections, uh, subject to uh, schedule six approval if required to uh, cover any minor impact on the existing water course. Uh, environmental health of no objections, um, with an informative regarding minimum potential impact of uh, certain noise sources. Uh, shared environmental services requested ecological habitat survey to be undertaken. Uh, these works were completed by Wallow Environmental with um, nothing untoward found that would impair the development. Uh, shared, shared environmental services uh, have accepted the support and have no objections to the proposals. The NA Water Management have also issued, um, they have no objections to approval subject to the uh, discharge consent approval for any proposed septic tanks or discharge to waterways. Um, in our opinion, I feel that, that these responses, they've all been very positive and supportive of our application and go some way to confirm the minimal impact of our proposals on the environment, existing natural habitat, wildlife and the local road network. Uh, regarding the reasons for uh, refusal and that there are no overriding reasons why this dwelling is considered essential, um, I'm going to leave that one up to uh, Emma in, in a minute to um, come in and have, have a word on that. With regard to the policy issues, uh, CTY 13 of PPS 21, and that it would create a prominent feature, um, I, I would I, I would dispute that, and, and, and I, I would be of a different opinion. And it, it's fairly well set back from the road, and any of the views that might be had of the proposed dwelling, they're quite limited, and they are from quite a far distance. And, you know, I, I would also say it doesn't form a prominent feature in the landscape. And uh, given that it's somewhat obscured from view, given its location to the rear of the existing dwelling, and it also benefits from quite existing mature natural boundaries, which the applicant has committed to maintaining. So neither the, self, the site itself nor any ancillary works require the use of new or additional landscaping for integration. And the design of the building will be fairly modest in its nature, uh, fitting for a site and location. Uh, and also, it, it wasn't really mentioned there, but there are two further buildings farther up the laneway, which would be more prominent in the landscape, and indeed would break the, the, the skyline. There's another dwelling, and there's an agricultural building. So uh, if I could refer you to pictures in the planning report, uh, picture numbers 6, 7, 8, and 9, it's very, very difficult to see the actual uh, proposed site and, and those photographs. And if any, there'll be fairly minimal views from those vantage points, which which the photographs have been taken of. Um, so I would, you know, basically, in my opinion, I feel that these proposals present a reasonably good site. It sits well, not with the specific policy of CTY 13, but in wider policy. And, and I must add that I feel sometimes I'm quite often approached with applications of these nature. And for a, what I would class as a non-farming rural dweller, there's very little allowance and policy for, for people uh, in them a situation who find themselves wanting to remain on family land where they've been brought up their entire lives. You know, so like I say, backed up by a full positive suite of consultation responses, it wouldn't be uncommon if the planning office had any concerns about integration that these could be addressed via negative condition to restrict the ridge height, the dwelling area, or even the location of the proposed dwelling within the site.
and these are all options that we'd be amenable to and uh can i just also mention as well that this application is brought forward today without any objections of, of any nature from neighbors or consultees so um that being said uh i wouldn't mind if uh, emma could be afforded the opportunity to say a few words thank you me, Thank you, Mark. Emma, just bear with me. I just I owe you an apology, Emma. I wasn't I wasn't aware that you were online and would wish to speak. So look, I'll give you a minute or two. Um I'd be more impatient uh, with that. Um so uh, feel free to address the committee. Thank you. Um thank you, Mark, and thank you, Chair Members, for allowing me the opportunity to express my concerns regarding the view to refuse the planning application. Um firstly, it's stated in the planning committee report that I'm a non-farming rural dweller who wishes to remain in the countryside on family land. Um, and this isn't considered to be a compelling reason for a new dwelling. And just I couldn't disagree anymore. Um, to me, what could be more important than providing long term security for my family? I have lived happily on our family land my whole life and want the same for my children. We want to remain close to our family and have many personal, social and professional reasons for doing so. It has been very difficult over the last few years searching the countryside for somewhere permanent to call home. We have faced difficulties in trying to get long term leases in the countryside where there are so few houses available for rent, um, much less for sale. Um, Councillors will know this already as there's always frequent reports in the papers on housing crisis. We're a young family and need support in regards to childcare so that I can continue full time work. As a professional in the health service, I want the opportunity to live locally and continue to contribute to the local community. As well as this, given the unsociable hours I work and the stress of the job, particularly over the last few years with COVID, I need our home to be a quiet, nurturing space for me and my family. My long-term partner also works as a football coach locally with young children, uh, developing their skills and their confidence. We want to remain valued members of our local community our neighbours have expressed no concerns um, with the new build and have actually been very supportive. I understand that there are policies to adhere to, but I also firmly believe that it's vital the planning system is able to meet the needs of rural communities so that people who want to live where they grew up are able to do so. I would like to thank the council members for their consideration of our application, but I would respectfully like to ask you to look again at the many positives in the planning report and to reconsider the recommendation based on the minimal impact this site has on the landscape and the environment and how it will transform our lives for the better. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, and I, again, thank you, Mark. Um, members, uh, you all know the drill by now. Um, uh, uh, if you have any questions you'd like to direct to either Mark or Emma, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to answer them so op open to the floor again for questions observations whatever councillor kelly thanks chair um i have a question for the uh, agent uh, and it's in relation to um we, we were presented with um it doesn't um, this application site doesn't present an opportunity under policy, but uh, in the, the presentation of the agent, he did mention the, the lane, the lane way, uh, the house and the neighbouring house and agricultural shed. Um, I mean, I'm counting that up under policy and laneways are counted within policy. So that would be the applicant, the applicant, the neighbouring house, the applicant's house and an agricultural shed and a laneway, which we considered four under policy, is that is that right? So that, that there, this could be considered under that policy. Um, I know they're, they're staggered, but it does allow for that in the policy. Well, I, 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 are you okay to proceed with an answer to that? Well, look, I'll take the, I'll take the, um, uh, the the agent um, view on that now, I suppose, and and, and perhaps we could direct that the officers as well later on. Uh, so go ahead, uh, go ahead, Mark. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't disagree with what the councillor Kelly has uh, has said. There is a laneway and there is a there is a gap. Um, I mean, I, I, I do accept that it's it's um, 
it, it doesn't fit neatly within within uh, policy CTY yet for a gap site, uh, which is why we, we hadn't applied for uh, the site under CTY yet at first instance, and it was only on request from planning service that we had to we had to provide uh, a policy that it would closest fit, uh, which again brings me back to the issue of of, of uh, I feel that the these sites or sites of this nature aren't catered for within uh, current policy. So, uh, but yes, I accept Councillor, what Councillor Kelly has said, it, it could be argued that it does, it does fit within CTY yet on that basis of the existing anyway and the other buildings. Do you want to come back on, Dan? Yeah. Yeah, just to say, Chair, I, I do accept that because I think this is something um, that Councillor McGuire has been raising uh, time and time and time again in terms of uh, non-farming rural dwellers and the uh, the lack of scope within policy to address people uh, who don't come from a, a farming background but who live in the countryside. And, um, and I mean, those those uh, points have been uh, so well rehearsed, I'm not going to kind of go over them all again. But I mean, he's he's been at this since uh, since time immemorial. And, you know, we've, we've perhaps Gunnar's listening to it, but at least, you know, he, he, never, he never lets up. And I, I think this is one of those cases where it's just falling between so many stools and it's just, there isn't, there isn't a nice, concise policy that deals with this type of application. Yeah. Okay. I, I, um, Councillor McGuire, I think he's still online. Hopefully, he didn't take any offence to being scunnered. Um, uh, uh, right. Members, again, have any further questions for um, Mark or Emma? <laughs> Sorry for laughing there. Uh, if anybody's reading the chat box, thank you, yeah, Councillor McGuire. Um, okay, that's for that's a wee personal one for yourself, there, Councillor Kelly. Uh, is there any further uh, questions for uh, the uh, the applicant, the uh, agent, or the uh, the uh, or Emma, Councillor Kelly? Come on back in. Chair, just in terms of the ridge height that's proposed, this is an outline application, and the, uh, the agent did reference the fact that uh, they, this could be something that could be conditioned. Um, but I'm just, I mean, I look at the, the photographs and I'm, I'm seeing, I mean, there, I think there's scope um, for a story and a half house within that. I'm looking at those photographs that were pointed out to us, six, seven, eight, and nine, and I see um, there's a telegraph pole, you know, conveniently in one of them or two of them. Which kind of gives us a sort of a scale, uh, so you can see that uh, you know a story and a half house uh, would sit below the level of the the, the electric pole, obviously, uh, so that would be accommodated within the landscape. Looking at those points uh, from which the the photographs have been taken, given the backdrop of the trees and the mountain. Yeah, thanks for that observation, Councillor Kelly. Um, Anybody else any other questions? I do. I do have one for you, Mark. Um, clearly, it's, it's, an, it's an outline application, but there is a significant amount of foliage there, uh, as pointed out by Councillor Kelly as well. You know, there are relatively mature-looking trees. What would be your What would be your your view in, in trying to move forward with the retention of that? That 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 looks to me like that's potential cover for any uh, future development. Of, of of this particular height. Uh, yes, uh, Chair, uh, the applicant has uh, indicated that she would be more than happy to retain the uh, that substantial landscaping uh, buffer between um, between their proposed site and the existing fields, but behind and and, and, and uh, to the to the west or southwest of the site. So uh, there's no issue at all in retaining those. In fact, it was mentioned in one of uh, I think it might be the shared environmental services response that uh, during construction there was to be a 10 meter buffer retained to that end of the site. But I mean that's there's no problem in, in maintaining uh, that uh, landscape belt in perpetuity. Uh, no issue with that at all. Okay, uh, thanks, Mark. That may prove useful. Um, okay, any other questions, members? Right, uh, uh, Mark, thanks for that. Uh, thank you, Emma. Stay with us. Um, members, uh, do you have any questions for um, Katrina? Professor Kelly? 
Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Katrina, for uh, the presentation. I'm just, I've got one, Chair, and it's just in terms of the the, the prominent feature in the landscape uh, consideration. And I wonder uh, when you were considering uh, the site um, from the various vantage points, how did the, the wind turbines, um, particularly the, the, the one that's in the photograph um, on, on figure eight, how did I mean, I travel that road uh, pretty much every day coming in and out of Strabane. I live about five miles further on out into the Spearns along that road at, at Murla. So without, you know, veering into territory, which might otherwise be considered a site visit, Chair, I, I, I'm, I'm familiar enough with the site without having been on the site. <laughs> so I'm just, I mean, from my route in and out of Strabane, for example, I mean, it, what attracts my attention when I'm dri driving down those roads is the turbines that are moving in the landscape, not not the houses that are peppered you know, across through the fields. And I'm just wondering, when you consider you know the, the prominence of things like this in the landscape, what how much weight do you give to the fact that there's there's quite a number of turbines um, in your in your line of sight at various locations where those photographs would have been taken? Well. Obviously, turbines are different from houses and, you know, they're different scale and different views. So what we considered here is when you're driving from the south to the north along that road, um, the agent said that you can see that other house is 160 metres on up the laneway away from this house. But you, you can't hardly see it at all because it's a very dull stone and trees. You have to physically look. You wouldn't know there's a house there if you're driving along. But if a house is positioned on this higher level behind this house, you will see another house when you're driving along here. Um, now, the turbines, I get it. You're driving along, you see the turbines, but it, it won't minimise the impact of having another dwelling. You'll just see a turbine and another dwelling, you know. So now in terms of if you wanted to go back to the CTY8 um, reasoning, um, the CTY8 infill, um, we do not consider that the other um, house along the laneway, it's 160 metres away, um, that it would contribute to the three dwellings in a row. Um, we had a very long discussion last month in terms of recent JR decisions, and um, it, it, the recent JR decisions don't contain any flexibility within policy CTY8. So the exception should be where it's considered that damage has already been done to the rural area. And by putting another house into a site, that it um, it would have absolutely no impact on the area. You wouldn't really notice it, and that's why we've con we've refused it under the two refusal reasons that we have, because it just doesn't meet the policy. So, thanks, Katrina. All right, about that. Yeah, I come back. Just uh, on another point, chair. In terms of the um, the layout, I suppose having those two houses together. I mean, how did you? find that proposal vis-a-vis -vis the other you know there's one across the at the t-junction on one of those pictures there where you have the two houses on the one side and then the recent approval under delegated authority just further along the curly hill road from where that photograph is taken um there's two houses there on a former hall site that were approved recently uh, so there's a style of uh, building within that sort of uh, that side of, of uh Knock of all that there's there's kind of you know you've got that style of where there's two houses nearly two and two and two and you know it's it's a common enough feature. Um, maybe coming on. Bear with me. You want to yeah, address that? On that. Um, yeah. I, 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 and what you're saying, Councillor Kelly, is really to do its character of the area that there's pairs. That there's, but the policy we don't have a policy for that. Okay, so we either have it meets CTY one, it meets CTY two A three. Eight, you know what I mean? So really looking at this, it's along a laneway, there's one dwelling, there's no infill opportunity. Um, there's there's such a great distance factually, there's no infill opportunity here. Um, and in terms of integration, it's obviously an elevated land. Um, so that is the recommendation. That's the only recommendation officers could have come to on this. And that's the only thing that we're required to do under PPS 21 in terms of assessing it. Thank you, Suzanne. <coughs> Okay, any other questions, members? No. I suppose, Councillor Kelly, were you 
uh, I'm, I'm I'm trying to follow where, where your thinking was on that as well. Um, it sounded to me like you were saying we we do have something of a precedent there. Is that is that really where you're coming from? Because that's certainly what it sounded like to me. Just you're helping me if you can answer that. There is that. I was trying to find out if there was something uh, that would kind of set us within policy, Chair. Uh, given that officers have said that's not the case, then I suppose the only other option then is under the Stravan area plan that allows us to set aside policy uh, and, and and make an exceptional case. Um, and that would be, I suppose, where I was kind of thinking. You know, I was trying to keep it within policy if, the, if that scope was there. And given what officers have said, I suppose that's not going to be an option. So I'm going to have to, uh, when it comes to making a proposal, you know, deploy the, 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 the scope that exists within the Stravan area plan to allow us to set aside policy uh, in this case. Okay, thanks, Councillor Kelly. I don't have any other questions from any other members. Um, and you have indicated that you have a, a particular view, so I suppose we'll hear that from you now. Councillor Kelly, if you're ready to do that. Um, yeah, yeah uh, yes, Chair, I am. Um, uh, I don't accept, I mean, if I'm making a proposal, I don't accept the officer's uh, recommendation and I've kind of outlined to some degree why. Uh, and given that there isn't scope within policy as outlined, I'm going to um, ask that under um, Strabane area plan uh, that we set aside policy and, and, and use the, ex the exception that's there uh, in order to um, approve this application. Uh, the exception is at 123.2.1 of the Strabane area plan. Um, I think the, the site is a good one. Uh, I think it follows the, the development pattern for that side of the knock of Bow Mountain, you know, you do have those two, those two, those pairs of, of houses uh, in the landscape, um, including some fairly recently approved uh, by council under delegated authority. Uh, I think there's, um, I think there's enough vegetation. I think the backdrop of the mountain itself provides uh, a, a high degree of integration. I'm, I'm not. I don't agree with the, the assessment along some of the routes because one of the routes I travel today, the 300 meter one is actually the site is completely screened, uh, except for the last 20 metres, um, by, by a very substantial vegetation on the other side of the road. So when you're travelling along, it actually the whole site is screened, except for the last 20 metres. So the, the, the range of some of the views is, is short um, and in terms of impact. Um, so I think uh, that's, pr that's pretty much me. In terms of what uh, I do have an issue with the um, condition that's attached by uh, DFI roads in relation to the parapet bridge. I know that's not a determinant issue in this case, Chair, but I do have an issue with it because I think what they're proposing is pretty much nonsense. Um, they built a bridge, as you can see in the photographs in that report in 2013, uh, and they breached their own regulations at that time, the DCAN 15 regulations. Uh, and now, instead of just acting with a little bit of humility and saying, look, we got it wrong, they're putting the, the applicant in this case uh, through hoops in terms of culverting, uh, extending the culvert, which, as we know, uh, in principle, is is broadly uh, um, against planning policy. Uh, the demolition uh, of that uh, parapet wall, the construction that's involved then of that civil engineering works that they're proposing, uh, the culverting, the interference with the water course and the environment, um, and the cost, not just in terms of the, the financial cost to the applicant, but the cost in terms of um, the, this, the time that's wasted on this by officers having to process this information and the applicants having to come with all of this information. So I think if that condition is attached um, in the event that it might be uh, overturned, uh, that needs to be looked again uh, because that's not it's not satisfactory. And we've been here before uh, with DFI roads for the past 18 months and we're not getting satisfactory answers around some of the nonsense they're uh, attaching to um, uh, applications coming in from the Straban plan area. To my mind, Chair, the, the, the obvious solution is that they retain the parapet wall in situ and just reduce it from the 120 centimetres to the 105 without all of that interference. You get the same planning result, you get the same road safety result, which is uh, the sight lines are achieved uh, to DCAN standards without all of that additional work and cost uh, and interference with the environment. So I, I have an issue with DFI roads. This is not directed at our planning uh, department. This is this is very much uh, owned by DFI Roads, and it is a problem 
Uh, it's it's one we've raised before, going back maybe a year or more, uh, and it's 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 not been resolved. As we can see, it's still coming through on these uh, applications, and it is impacting. Like that's been a year uh, in the system that our application, and um, I, I'm no doubt a huge portion of that time has been addressing this around the parapet wall and the, the need for all of this additional drawings and and paperwork that's required to be processed as part of that. So I think. Uh, you know, for those um, who have, you know, ears to hear, I suppose, where it needs to be heard, uh, I would hope that the message is taken back, uh, that that we do need to have a conversation with DFI Rose, they need to waken up uh, to the reality. It's not good enough coming into the chamber and saying we have a good relationship with, with DFI Rose and we don't want to compromise that. But if you have a good relationship with somebody, then you're able to argue over these sticky points uh, and, and get a, a resolution to them. I know that's a side issue and uh, it's something that needs to be said not in relation really to this application, but generally to applications where they're where they're messing about. And I think that um, I, I just I'll leave it at that, Chair. But in terms of the proposal, that's that's where I'm at. It's it's the exception under the policy uh, uh, in uh, the Stavan area plan. And in terms of integration, I, I, it's my opinion it can integrate well into the landscape. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Barr. You're happy to second. Councillor Jason Barr second on that. Thank you, Jason. Uh, and um, well, you know what, um, Councillor Kelly, if you feel it had to be said and you feel you had to say it, then you say it. Um, and I don't find myself disagreeing with you an awful lot on, on that particular score. But as you said, it's for another day. It is probably for another day. But I think, you know, that'll be, that should be noted today as well um, uh, as, as we try to proceed forward. Bearing in mind all of the other conversations that we're continually having and, and working groups and, and uh, indeed on this planning committee as well. Uh, and the development of our LDP and, you know, I mean, could be here all day, but, you know, you, I think I think it's a point well made. Um, so uh, we have a proposer, we have a seconder, um, Councillor Kelly and Councillor Barr, uh, and it's uh, to overturn the, the recommendation uh, based on um, uh, Councillor Kelly's um, referral to the uh, the the, the Strabat area plan. So I'm sure officers have that noted. So if more, um, if you could uh, take us through the vote. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is a proposal not to accept the officer's recommendation, and it's item six. Alderman Alan Breslin. Four. Thank you. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Four, Mara. Thank you. Alderman Drew Thompson. Barr, Barr. Thank you. Councillor Jason Barr. Barr. Thanks. Councillor Raymond Barr has gone. Councillor John Boyle. Barr. Thank you. Councillor Angela Dobbins, his apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Four. Thank you. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Four. Four, thanks. Councillor Dan Kelly. Four. Councillor Patricia Logue. Four, Mara. Four, thanks. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Four, Mara. Thanks, Kieran. Councillor Philip McKinney. Thank you. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Yes. Okay, thank you. So that's. Eleven. Four and one against. Eleven, four, one against. Um, so. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Councillor Barr. Uh, and of course, thank you to Mark and Emma for joining us. And again, thanks uh, for your uh, for your patience. Uh, it can be a long wait sometimes, but believe me, you got a wee bit luckier today than some applicants because uh, there's been many a day that they've had to wait until the next day. So um, uh, much appreciated. Uh, and we'll wish you a good day and uh, uh, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. Um, members, the next item on the agenda, item number nine, which is the DFC HED consultation on the proposed listing of the Mulvin Bridge. Uh, and John, you're going to take us through that report, I believe. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. So um, this is the consultation on the proposed listing of Mulvin Bridge, which is a former railway bridge. Um, the Council has been consulted by DFC Historic Environment Division about the proposed listing of the bridge, which is about one and a half kilometres south of Victoria Bridge. And views are to be received by 21st of October. 
It's a steel former railway bridge and it spans the River Morn in a wooded area. Uh, the railway dated from about 1850 and the bridge itself was the third bridge on the site and was built around 1910. So it has group value with two other bridges which are already listed, uh, Camus Bridge and Breen Bridge. And it's considered to be an important historic feature locally and a rare example of a steel railway bridge of which only five others are listed in Northern Ireland. Uh, a planning history search revealed no current planning applications which would impact on the proposed listing of the bridge and officers uh, would welcome the um, listing which would add to the historic interest of the area. Planning officers consider that the council should respond agreeing to the listing. A draft letter for agreement is attached at Appendix 9. Members are asked to note the comments of the report and to agree to planning officers responding to HED to support, support the proposed listing as in the draft letter. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Members, over to yourselves. Um, um, anybody? Councillor Kelly? Happy to propose, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Kelly, um, seconder? I'll second the Chair. Thank you. Keith? Thank you. Sorry, Chair. No, I, I, I was just going to propose or thank it, but it's all right. Sorry, I think I hit. Was that yourself, Councillor Gellar, seconding? Well, Chair, yeah. I will we'll take your second. And uh, Keith, thanks for putting it in the, the chat box. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, these these structures, as far as I'm concerned, I would agree with the, the, the proposer. Um, um, these are well worth protecting, well worth listing. Who knows what the future holds? Um, you could have, you know, uh, walkways and cycle paths and years to come going up and along these particular types of bridges and sure wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to see could be a long time after i'm dead but who knows you never know yeah exactly uh, so members um i haven't heard anybody saying they don't fancy the idea of supporting this unless i do i'm going to take it as a unanimous support for it Okay, we'll carry that. So, John, thank you again for um, preparing the report. Fascinating history attached to it as well. So, um, well worth the well worth the time. See, we learned something. I learned something new. You know, every day is a school day and all that. So, thank you again, John, for the um, for the report. Thank you. Uh, and item number ten, John, you've uh, sat with us a fair fair while today as well. So, again, thanks to you for for uh, your patience. And item number ten then is the. Confirmation of a tree preservation order at 64 Colmo Road, uh, Stroke Darlene Park. And I'll pass it over to yourself, John, for the report. Yep, so uh, this is um, 64 Colmo Road, Darlene Park, Derry, and it's the confirmation of a tree preservation order. Members will recall a provisional tree preservation order was made at this site on the 4th of May this year, following agreement at Planning Committee in March. Provisional orders last for six months, after which they lapse unless confirmed. Members' consideration and agreement is now required to confirm the order before the provisional order, lapse, uh, order lapses on the 4th of November this year. Officers have considered the matter fully and commissioned a tree survey. The survey, which is attached to the report, Appendix 11, confirms that the majority of the trees, there's 45 individuals and five groups of trees, are good specimens in fir condition and worthy of inclusion in the TPO. A mix of mature trees, both coniferous and deciduous, exist on the northwest boundary in the verge of Darling Park, and semi-mature beech trees in the southeast corner of the site Officers have had regard to the criteria for determining whether a TPO should be served, and the criteria are attached to Appendix 10 of the report. So looking at those criteria, the trees are under potential threat. There is a live planning application which would affect some of the trees. In terms of their appearance and condition, they're tall trees and good specimens forming attractive features in a prominent location in the local landscape. Visible from some distance to travellers on the main road 
between the city and the Foyle Bridge. They provide year-long and seasonal interest and biodiversity value and are considered to have significant amenity value and positive collective impact. As part of the service of the provisional TPO, the applicant and agent for the planning application and all directly affected neighbours were notified, but no comments or objections were received within the specified 28-day period. It's recommended that the order be confirmed with modifications to exclude four of the trees which are of poor condition. And I'm happy to take questions if members have any. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, John, for the report. Um, I had a, when I seen this come up today, I had to go back and and look at at, at the paper that was submitted in March. Um, and it was my recollection that at the March committee, and I'm conscious that it was discussed in confidential business, um, but there was reference to a live planning application on this site. Um, there was some suggestion that in advance of that application, some trees had been removed. Um, and there was a recommendation that was put to committee that that temporary TPO would be put in place. They offer protection of the existing trees, um, whilst uh, without prejudicing um, an existing planning application. And I suppose now we're we're some months on, um, and the one question that occurs to me is, um, what? What level of engagement have we taken as a as a planning department um, with the applicant of the live planning application? Um, and, I, and, and I know we've because that that's that was my understanding of the purpose of the the temporary TPO was to allow the to allow the space and the time to engage with the applicant um, and 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 potentially amend plans taken into consideration um, the protection of those trees. Um, so without jumping, um, the um, confirming a permanent TPO, I, I would like to understand what levels of engagement we have taken as a council um, with those, with, with the, the applicant. I'm not too sure, John, if you're in a position to, to explain, but I, or to answer that, but I, I'm somewhat uncomfortable that um, that we would, uh, in in light of in receipt of any application, that we would jump to try and put barriers in place, um, and, and 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 manufacture refusal reasons. Um, I, I think in, in terms of, uh, in this instance, my, it was my understanding that that this measure was put in place. They, they allow the scope, um, they have the conversations, and they avoid any removal of trees um, in that interim period. So and I, I, I would be keen to know what, what's what's happened in that time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Councillor Jackson, Councillor Logue. Chair, an overall on special chair, but I would like to concur to you because I was just trying to I didn't look back on the on the the actual planning application, but I was just trying to sort of remember why why this was done, and now that has just confirmed it to me, and I, I just would be a wee bit um, concerned, have the same concern. Yeah. No, thanks, thanks a lot, Councillor Logan. I think it's in the report there that there's a pl there's one in the system for fourteen dwellings. Um, uh, who uh, would like to take that, Laura? Yeah. Uh, I suppose it's just to confirm that the TPO process is a separate process to a, pl a current planning application, but that you know um, we the last the last paper was related to the tree preservation order, the temporary tree preservation order, which is an emergency um, TPO, which um, was brought to off to members to consider in order to protect trees that potentially could be a threat, but it was a request made by um, a member of the public, which we're obliged to consider and go through the due process. 
So um, the fact that there's an application, you can't you can't determine the application as you're determining the the TPO. Um, but I think it's important that members realise. I mean, there is a section here, three point five, that you know, immaterial whether there's a TPO on um, the site or not. Um, the trees within the site as part of the context of any design concept master plan for the site. And it's my understanding that during the processing of that application, and again, I can't go into detail in that because the application isn't in front of members, but that the agent has been made aware of the issues with the trees in regards to ensuring um, that that's a consideration of the development of a concept master plan for any proposal um, uh, on this site currently or in the future. Um, and that the, the process of a TPO that we've been asked to, to be considered is something that we have to go through due process because of the timeline and bringing that back in. So um, in terms of my understanding of the discussion was that that members had requested that we didn't bring back an application until the issue of the trees was resolved. This is the process that we would have to go through. We can't, you know, not do that. Otherwise, what we would be doing is leaving the temporary PT TPO to go out of expire. So um, officers have to consider that within a time frame and bring it to yourselves to consider whether or not you wish to confirm it or not. Um, in terms of the planning application, um, my understanding is again I can't go into detail. We're not here to we're not presenting the application today, and for that very reason, and that you know we need to consider this aspect in terms of the trees. But officers have assured me that um, the application and the system that the agent is fully aware of the trees and also uh, according to the report and to those officers that they've been aware, made aware that there's a request for a TPO by a member of the public, which this council has to consider as well. So it's about the sequencing of, of this. And as I say, we, we wouldn't be bringing the application and uh, returning the application before we would consider the, the TPO. Um, and, you know, it's a difficult you know, sequencing, and as opposed from my perspective, um, we are simply doing our due diligence in terms of what the TPO criteria is, what the agriculture report has said, and we have assessed that from an officer perspective. And um, and as I say, any application would have to take due consideration of trees, whether they're TPO or not. Thank you, Moa. Okay. Go ahead, Christopher. Um, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Moa, for that. Um, and it's it's a sequence and that's given me cause of concern. Um I've I've looked through the report that was that was sent uh, that was issued in in March of this year, and it's very clear within that report that the the temporary TPO was a result of a live planning application. It doesn't stay state within it. Or if it does, I'd must it. Um, but it doesn't state that it's it was it was on upon request of a member of the public. It states that um, and and it lists the application, the the nature of the application, and 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 because of that, um, that members were requested to consider well or a, t a temporary TPO was was uh was necessary and and I think all the reasons um that's outlined in this report was outlined in our report around the benefit um and the immediate value that that those trees provided so um that's that 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 was the rationale why I, I personally supported the TPO um the uh, or the temporary TPO was the the alloy the, the space the the process that the the live planning application um I, i'm in a situation now where i feel that if if we're going to confirm the tpo we're almost prejudicing a live planning application um and th that that's something i'm i'm in terms of sequencing i'm not well comfortable with 
Can I come back to you, Chair? Please do, yes, please I think do. the the response in terms of what the paper and the discussion is that the the request came about as a part of an objection and the processing of the planning application. So that's officers were clear, you know, that that's, you know, by just because there's an application in the system, you know, there was a request made through that process and a request was made, you know, in order for a council, it wasn't officers just considering that, you know, there was queries and concerns raised um, through that process, which we obviously as officers let you know that we're obliged to consider. Um, so it's, it's important to know that, um, you know, what mayor officers are recommending at the moment is a confirmation of the TPO with modification. Any TPO can be revoked, any TPO can be modified thereafter. So if during the process of, an, uh, of, of any application and there's a, you know, the applicant can request an amendment to the TPO, an, an applicant or a, an owner can request at any stage for a tree to be removed on the basis of dangerous, various issues. So it doesn't preclude anything happening in the future. And also to bear in mind is the fact that I've just stated very clearly that during the processing of any housing development, QD7 and any policy that we must take account of trees and material, whether there's a TPO on it or not. And I think what uh, I just want to remind members is there was the, the TPO emergency is about the threat of losing and destroying trees from, you know, obviously previous issues and previous experiences in this council. You know, it's been something that members have obviously asked us to be aware of. Um, so we're obliged to bring that to your attention. And again, if somebody's asked for a TPO, we're obliged to consider it. So at this stage, we're, we're at that point before we come back with the planning application at whatever stage, but the developer or the owner of the site or any future proposal that goes on that site must take account of those trees and ensure that it is compliant with policy and a concept master plan is, is compliant with policy. So, as I say, if needs be that there's a, there is an um, issue with, um, do you know, um, that there's a loss of trees, danger to these trees because of their condition um, moving forward. There could be situations where we will get requests for that to be modified. And should during the processing of a future planning application, we may want to modify or, or amend the, the TPO or in fact revoke a, a TPO. That is something, there is a, a separate process uh, in regards to that. So, so I think it's important to highlight that. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. That is important to highlight that. Uh, Councillor Logue. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and Maura, just to follow on from that, uh, I do know that we have to um, take into account of all trees, vegetation, whatever, when we are uh, making planning decisions. However, I just want to... I, I still am a bit nervous, I suppose, um, about some of the wording. Uh, in this report, and I want to refer you to uh, 3.5, and I suppose it's the first um, the first um, sentence. The proposed housing scheme that is subject to the, of a current planning application would need to be re reviewed subsequently if the TPO is placed on the site and a developable area ascertained negotiated. So, you know, we are already putting, uh, if we, we are putting, um, I suppose, uh, our position, our position forward on a, an application that has not come to us yet. And we're already asking for a renegotiate. You know, that, that might go on behind the scenes, but I'm just worried about it being here in this report. Um, okay, Councillor Logue. Um, uh, you can indeed, more. Yep, go ahead. So what that means is that the information that's provided by us, I mean, obviously there's a very detailed agriculturist independent report carried out there. 
so that would be obviously available to anybody. It'll be available to members of the public. It will be available to um, the agents or whoever it is is potentially designing the site. And they can obviously take cognizance of that in terms of whether there's issues in and around trees being removed, trees to be protected in or in their ownership or outside their ownership. Um, so that is information that clearly can be used to review um, any proposal. So I suppose that's what, you know, the confirmation or not the confirmation or the modification. And I mean, members can take the view that they don't need to uh, confirm the TPO and you can let it lapse or you could decide, you know, to, I don't know, you can modify what, what the suggest, what the recommendation is. I mean, at the end of the day, officers are only given their recommendation. And as I say, there is an opportunity to review that and um, really, and it ultimately goes back to the fact that the trees should be protected in any case. Um, but in the process of the application, all those matters have to be considered, like the access or whatever, you know, and it is difficult because there is two, two, two processes, but they can't run along uh, each other at the same time. But, you know, because we have a deadline with the, the TPO, we have to bring it with you to give our members the opportunity to make a decision on it. If we don't, we would be accused of letting it lapse and the trees then no longer protected. Chair, just to, just to come back on that, Chair, look, uh, Maura, I totally agree. We have to protect trees, and, and that would be my uh, position too as, as well. However, I'm just a bit nervous, especially with that sentence that I just read out, that, you know, there could be legal implications for a case that we plan an application that we haven't even, uh, that, that hasn't come to us yet for decision. So maybe a wee bit of legal advice around it would be appreciated. Okay, um, uh, I'm sure we can get that. Um, just before we do, um, Councillor Jackson. Chair, I'm, I'm content to make a proposal that we, we don't confirm this. Well, uh, can we TPO? hear from other members before you do that? Uh, well, I can make a proposal. You I, can, I, I know, but I mean, I got to try to do this in an, order, that, yeah. an orderly fashion, but I mean... Uh, but, but if I, you want to make a proposal, go ahead. Yeah, um, people don't necessarily have to agree with it. No, a hundred percent, and that's. Um, but given given the fact that I feel that confirming a, a TPO at this site is predetermined the outcome of an application, I'm just looking, and, and the only detail I've got of the application is contained within this report. And what's jumping out at me is the application set in twenty twenty. Um, so. I don't know when in 2020 that was lodged, but um, it's a number of years old. Um, and they they come in two years later, and 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 confirm a tree preservation order. They 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 they, they, they prejudice um, or an application. I, I I just have grave concerns around it. Um, the head of planning has outlined the. The benefits of the the tree survey that's been carried out, um, and I would hope um, that that the applicant um, would, would would consider that report um, and and factor that on the any potential application. But I don't feel comfortable in terms of predetermining an application at this stage and and confirming that uh, the TPO. In my view, would do that. So, um, I would urge our our planning department to be processing the application as soon as possible, get it back, and do this chamber and 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 allow us to discuss it, determine it with all the information that's in front of us. Um, the 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 confirming the confirmation of a tree preservation order, in my view, um, shouldn't. Be a prerequisite to that. So that's just my view, and that's the basis of the proposal that I'm making. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Does anybody else wants to make any comment about this, Councillor uh, Minnie? Thank you, Chair. I, I'm I'm just struggling to see how or where any prejudice would attach to an application. 
Uh, my sort of view, I'm looking at it, is that like sort of parallel processes or applications. You have a TPO that has been granted on an interim basis in, in March. It's now due to expire, but the head of planning has confirmed that upon that, any applications brought, that there's a application on the system, which undoubtedly there is. Um, an application can be brought in any way to discharge uh, the TPO at any stage. Um, so I think primarily I'm looking at it on the basis that this this uh, TPO is to protect trees, not to interfere with the current applications in the system. It's been outlined by the head of planning that once the application process goes through, there's policies that will actually look at the trees themselves in situ. But I take heart in the fact is that obviously if a, if a TPO is implemented or not today, if it is, then the applicant or whatever else in the system can apply for discharge on that basis or a variation of the order. So I just don't see where, I can't see where the prejudice attaches. I know the word prejudice has been, has been used, but if somebody could let me know about that prejudice, the application going forward, is there any prejudice that could attach to the application on that basis if there was a TPO in place? But my mind says the end is one, it's one in parallel to the application rather than actually converging with the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mooney. Just for clarity, because um, that's Councillor Mooney's interpretation of what you said. Would that be a fair and reasonable interpretation? Well, yeah. Yeah, we have powers to vary a TPO. We have powers to revoke a TPO. And, you know, obviously those, in order to do that, you know, you obviously have to consider relevant issues. And um, and it is, you're quite right. It's also important, you know, to look at the, the overall um, management of any site and take on board, you know, various um, issues. So therefore, you know, it's a balancing act, but, and, you know, that's what I say, you, you have a power to put a TPO on in full, put a TPO on in modification. You can put a TPO, you can alter a TPO, and then you can also then um, revoke a whole TPO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Maura. Uh One further question for uh, going ahead, Sean. Sorry, just a follow up, Chair. So, really, from what I heard, is there is really no prejudice attaching to the application. I don't see any. That's my own personal interpretation. There doesn't seem to be any prejudice that can attach to the application with the implementation of a TPO. Okay. Yeah. Um, further to that, and I've got a question for yourself, John. Um, obviously, we're looking at a map here. Um, I have it as page two, three, one. Um, most of these trees uh, abut um, the boundary of number 64 and number 66. Uh, Colmore Road, isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Number 64, number 66, Colmore Road. And uh, I'm just looking at the accuracy of the map. Or, we don't know which side of that boundary these trees are on. We're looking at this map, John. Um, uh, uh, some of them may well be in the inside the boundary of 66 and beyond the control of 64 and vice versa. Is that a fair point? Yeah, um, that's a fair summary. So uh, most of the trees actually are off um, the site of number 64, which is the one where the current planning application is. And they are actually in the verge of uh, a road which is called Darling Park, which runs off um, the main Colmore Road um, beside those trees. And you can see it on in the report. There's a, a photograph looking down um, that road. It's on it's on the third page of uh, the report, the um, tree report. And so those trees are in the verge of Culmore Road. So, um, yeah, they that's those trees. And then the trees at the front of the site, uh, which are semi-mature beech trees, quite tall, um, they are within um, number 64 site. And there's a number of tree groups as well that are within that property. And then there's a small number of trees that are within the other site, uh, which is St Elmo site, uh, which you can see there on the plan as well. So, yeah, most of the trees are off the site is uh, probably a fair summary. 
Um, might be an unfair question, don't answer it if you haven't got the answer. Percentage wise, how many are off the site? How many are on the site? Well, it's difficult to put a percentage on it because some of the ones that are on the site are tree groups and you can see those on the plan. So there's group 17, group 20, group 11. And there's another one I can't quite read without my reading glasses on, but there's a number of groups of trees. So in terms of numbers of trees, there's probably a lot that are on the site, but they're kind of grouped as, you know, they're given a single number for the tree group. They'll be quite young trees. So I'm not sure I'd be able to put a percentage on it without kind of calculating it. Depends if you mean number of individual trees or trees that are numbered in the report as either individual trees or groups. Uh, I'd say about 60% of the numbered trees are off the site. Okay. Now, um, do you reference the, 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 the young trees as well? And I can see where the grouping there is. Uh, and I would have always been of a view, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, I, I've always been of a thought, well, the younger the, a tree is, does it make it more valuable or less valuable uh, in relation to these matters? Because, um, call me old school, but I, I usually look at mighty oaks that have taken centuries to grow, and I value them perhaps more than the, the, a, a, a tree that was planted 20 years ago. Um, do you see where I'm coming from? And that would, I think, what I'm asking you here is those newer trees are probably represented in 17, 18, 11, was that 11 or something? My eyesight's not the best, 20 and 20 something here. But to be honest with you, you need a magnifying glass. Um, but that, that's that, those are the young, those, those woodlands, as I think you described them here in the report, woodland group. They're younger trees, aren't they? Uh, yeah, for the most part, those groups of trees are are younger. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question. But, um, yeah, there's only four trees that the tree report identified as uh, being of poor condition. And it's proposed uh, that if the tree preservation order is confirmed, those four trees would would not be included in the TPO. And that's trees number 14 to 16, um, which are on the boundary with St Elmo. Uh, one of them is in the St Elmo site, and 35 and 38, which are along along the Darling Park uh, Road. But all the other trees uh, are proposed for inclusion because they're all noted to be of fair condition in terms of their health and kind of good quality in terms of their, you know, characteristics. And one further question. Uh, I'm looking, the map I'm looking at here is, uh, I th there's like a yellow line. Is that the road that leads into Darlene Park? Here. What's that? <sighs> I'm just trying to find the map that you're looking at, Chair. Sorry. This one. So that John, that answer. That, that, I thank you for that, Philip. It's just I, I'm trying to work out. So you see the tree. This helps me with asking the question. So the trees that are along Darlene Park, they're on communal land. Is that correct? They're not. They don't belong to anybody. They're on communal land. Is that correct? And the people with responsibility for them would probably in all likelihood be uh, who? Uh, they're on the verge of Darling Park, but um, the road is adopted, but they're not owned by uh, roads. So it's uncertain who they're uh, owned by. The likelihood is um, it was a previous owner. Okay, sorry. Do you know what? The question I just had made things even more complicated for me, but I had to ask it anyway. Okay. So, Maura, do you want to come back in again? I think you thought you, you said you didn't know. 
No, okay. Um, all right, sorry about that, members. Um, just clears mud sometimes. Uh, so, Councillor Jackson, your proposal is. Uh, Chair, can I come on? Oh, uh, uh, yes, go ahead, Councillor Geller. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I know it's been well around the houses there. I, uh, to see, see around uh, preservation order, I, and it's been temporary. And I think that, you know, that in order to protect the preservation, that we, we should always be erring on the side of caution. And when, when it doesn't prejudice anything, I think that we should continue with the preservation order that it won't prejudice any future application and at any given time we can revoke it if, if necessary. If, if whatever, if someone comes in or whatever the case may be, we have the power to revoke it. I think that if we don't carry on with a preservation order and it runs out and for whatever reason those trees are cut down, Without a preservation order on them, I think we leave ourselves very vulnerable that we allowed it to lapse. So I think more weight should be given to the cautious side than removing the preservation order. So I know the Council of Jackson was about to make a proposal. <laughs> However, I would propose that we carry on with the preservation order. As, as a cautionary measure around protection and not to remove the protection. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gillard. Um, well, Councillor Jackson was in the process of making a proposal. That's where I was kind of thinking if we could get the conversation out of the way and then we would know, uh, be much clearer in our heads. Um, but, Councillor Jackson, you did make a proposal and your proposal is to remove, remove the TPO. Are you still of that mind? And if you are, then I'll need a yeah, second. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I, I agree with everything that Councillor Geller has said in terms of um, trees that merit protection um, and the amenity value of trees um, have been well rehearsed. My uh, um, my concern is, as I've said, is around the sequencing of it. Contained within the both reports is reference to LA planning application, and I, I know and I completely accept the the explanation um, that that we've received from the head of planning because I know it it has it, it the request came from a member of a, a public um, who objected to that application, but I I I just have concerns around um, the fact that our Judy, as a planning committee, they process applications um, and without prejudice. And my view in terms of issuing the temporary TPO was to protect those trees um, whilst the application was being processed. I, I, had, I had fully expected the application to be coming before this committee during that six month time frame. It, it hasn't. Um, and now we're we're in a position where us as a committee are confirming a permanent protection order. That that just sits uncomfortable with me. I think it's a, a, it's something that, in terms of precedent, that we've, that we've always said said um, that this could be something that's used by all our um, all our objectors for all our applications. And and we would nearly be, be be bound by that if if this is a process that we've continued to detect. I would have felt a lot more comfortable if the application was processed during that that six month time period. I know a lot of that might be outside of our control, um, but in terms of, um, in, in terms of the protection of trees, it's it's already outlined and it's contained within the report that the protection of these trees aren't reliant on a tree protection order. I think the best way for us to ensure the integrity of that those trees and um and they they maintain the amenity value is they have those open, frank conversations with the owner and the applicant in this case who we should be engaging with um regularly. 
and that's that's something that in, in respect to the live application that's something that i would have expected to happen um but uh, and on that basis i i i i i I'm, i i don't um well i, I still only i'm still content to, to maintain the proposal that we don't confirm the the tree protection order in this instance uh, thanks, Councillor Jackson. I think one of the things you said there was sometimes, um, and as we all know, progressing an application and delays in progressing an application do not necessarily always mean that it's a delay in the council planning team's uh, work towards that. It can be a number of other uh, different people who delay these processes. Yeah, thanks, we can all agree with that. Yeah, I think we do. Patricia, you know, I'm, I, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I've, look here, it's not for debate. I'm just making, I'm making the point. Uh, we all know um that there are a number of different consultees for want of a better way of putting it who can delay things and, and there could be even applicants themselves we don't know that we don't that so this application has to go through in the way that they all go through and when people come back with the information they're asked for then it progresses when uh, uh when people don't then of course uh we find ourselves in a situation like this where we're now sitting having to say to ourselves well, this application hasn't come back to us in six months, but now we have to make a decision about these trees. That's where we're sitting at. You've got a proposal. Do you have a seconder for that proposal? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, during my speaking, I did ask for legal advice, and I still, uh, before I can make up my mind, um, and I'm not saying I'll take or accept the legal advice, but I want it anyway. Um, but... Um, I still have concerns about uh, the wording of the report because it is mentioning another planning application and that is in 1.2 and 4 and 3.2 and 3.5 and it's saying in 4.1 that there's no financial equality, legal, HR improvement my opinion as it stands at the minute given what's on this report and the way i'm reading it that there is financial equality and legal implications okay well thank you um well you want to you said you want to come on again yeah. Sorry, I'm just conferring with the city solicitor. Bear with me. Okay, Councillor Jackson, go ahead. And and I suppose just just for for their clarity, um, I'm reading the report that was issued to this committee on March, um, and under one point one, it says that members are requested to consider. And deciding whether to make a, a, a temporary TPO, that it's likely to necessit, ne necessitate the subsequent refusal of a planning application for 15 houses due to its unacceptable impact on the TPO protected trees. That's clear to me that that's prejudicial. It's it, the, the words that 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 it's likely to necessitate the subsequent refusal. Of a of a lay planning application, that that sequencing is, is really really uncomfortable, and it's not something. It's not a way that 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 that, that I, I it's not something that I would support. Um, so that's that, 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 that that's the reason that's causing me a concern. Um, it's it's nothing to, to, to do with the information that's contained within the report. I think that that information should um, assist officers. And agents and developers to try and improve uh, and applications, but when we've got the wording that this protection order is 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 likely to necessitate the subsequent refusal, um, I, I feel I feel very uncomfortable um, with, uh, in terms of the route that we're going down, uh, and I, and I think that's uh, and in terms of the the points and the clarity that Councillor Mooney had received, uh, that's um, in direct contradiction to it. Thank you. 
Gee, Councillor Jackson and I'm going to afford they had a plan and an opportunity to reply and respond to some of the comments and, and observations that, that we've all made here. Yeah, that was discussed at the time. That that was an error. I mean, at, at the committee meeting, we discussed this matter and that was had gone. That statement went too far and I rectified that. I was questioned about it. Um, I spoke to the officer about it afterwards. I'd spoken to the, the top table in regards to the issue. I, 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 re, I highlighted it to members when we were discussing it. And I explained at the time that, you know, that it wouldn't. And we recall that discussion about sequencing. And, um, and that was all aired at the time. And I suppose you're going back on the written word. But we, we went through it all uh, and rehearsed it at the time. And as I say, that's my advice. The, the report that we've got in front of us, my advice at the moment, and I say, you know, take legal advice from Philip if you're not content with my advice. I suppose that's where I am. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so, Councillor Logue, you were looking to hear from the city solicitor. Obviously, we're in open business, so there would be a limit to you how much. If you want to go into confidential, to discuss some elements of what we're hearing, then we can do that too. Uh, bear in mind um, uh, as well, members, that um, we have a, a shortness of time now. Our four hours are almost up. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so um, I think I can deal with this reasonably succinctly. The concern, as I understand it, is in and around the wording of paragraph 3.5, uh, in particular of the report and the reference in relation to that. Uh, to the housing application and uh, to uh, potential prejudice. So it's reasonably straightforward if we break it down into the stages. Um, what's before us today um, is an application for a um, to confirm a TPO um, or a proposal uh, to confirm a TPO. The obligation which is on this committee is to take into account, is to make a decision in relation to that, taking into account uh, relevant material factors and not taking into account irrelevant material factors. So that reference in 3.5 doesn't and can't impact on the decision that you're making in relation to the TPO. The concern, as I understand it, would be that there is a prejudice in relation to the future planning application that might be coming forward as a result of the wording that is contained within 3.5. But of course, whenever, 3 point, whenever the planning application comes before us at that stage, what we will have to consider are the relevant material factors that are contained within the report in relation to the planning application as it's presented to us at that time, um, and uh, not to take into account any irrelevant factors uh, at that time. So the planning application, when it comes before us, will be informed by the case officer report, which will no doubt be its usual detailed, comprehensive self, uh, and which will uh, direct members' attention to the relevant material factors which they should be considering in relation to the planning application at that time. There's nothing contained within this report that members would be taking forward in relation to that which would be prejudicing their decision-making whenever they're dealing with that in the future. I think that's as clear and succinct as it can be in relation to that. The right. answer is that I don't think that 3.5, as it is currently worded, will prejudice the decision making of this committee in relation to the planning application going forward. Okay, members, so you have it. Yeah, um, uh, I think we've we've been through and round the houses to quote Councillor Gallagher earlier on in relation to this. Uh, the proposal from uh, Councillor Jackson seconded by Councillor Logue um, as effectively to not support the recommendation uh, in the paper uh, and the recommendation is that uh, the provisional tree preservation order should be confirmed with modifications to exclude 14, 16, 35, 38 as recommended in the tree survey report. Um, so um, members, we're going to put that to the vote now. Um, and we'll see where that takes us. So, more of you like to record the vote, Chair? Chair, see before we go forward with that, can we just say why we're making that recommendation? Could that be minuted, please? That means going back over. I mean, do you does everybody understand 
why that has been. I mean, Councillor Jackson said it twice. Does everybody understand? All committee members understand that? I, I, not that's not about understanding. I just saw just. But anyway, there's a there's a there's a there's, a, there's a, a an audio record of the, of all planning committee meetings. Okay, that'll do. Yeah. Um. So uh, I haven't seen anybody indicate that they don't know what they're voting for. So, um, uh, we'll progress with the vote. So if you want to take us through it, Mark. Yeah, members, this is in regard to paper, uh, the paper on item 10, and um, it's not to accept the, the officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin. Against. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Against, Mara. Alderman Drew Thompson. Against, Mara. Councillor Jason Barr. Councillor Barr. Jason Barr. No. Councillor Raymond Barr was gone. Councillor Boyle. Against. Councillor Angela Dobbins was apologies. <clears throat> Councillor Paul Gallagher. Against. Councillor Christopher Jackson. For. Councillor Dan Kelly. Councillor Patricia Logue. For. Councillor Kane McGuire. For. Councillor Philip McKinney. Councillor Sean Mooney. Against. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. That's uh, seven against and four for. Um, so uh, the proposal falls. Members uh, still sitting in front of you. Obviously, there's a recommendation now. Um, uh, and. Uh, Chair. Councillor Gallagher, yes. Chair, I propose we go with a recommendation. I think you were doing that earlier, Paul, so thank you very much. I'm going to need a seconder for that, Councillor Mooney. Okay, and again, just to take us through that vote, in case anybody's changed their mind. Okay, members, this is item 10, paper and item 10, and this is to go with the officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin. Oh, I'm Mara. Keith. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Or Mara. Um, Alderman Drew Thompson. Or Mara. Uh, Councillor Jason Barr. Back, no. 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 Uh, Councillor Raymond Barr, no. Councillor John Boyle. Or. Angela Dobbins, apologies. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Or. Um, Councillor Christopher Jackson. Against. Um, Councillor Dan Kelly. Um, Councillor Patricia Logue. Against. Councillor Keir McGuire. Against. Uh, Councillor Philip McKinney. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Or. Okay, Maura, thank you for that. Members, no great surprise in that. Um, uh, it's just a direct turn around on the uh, last, so that's seven, uh, four, and four against. Thank you, members. Uh, it was a conversation worth having. I think that's an important thing to reflect on uh, for all of us as well. Um, uh, so, um, okay, next item on the agenda. The planning appeals update. They are open for information, simply members open for information, uh, item 11, plan and appeal update, item 12, the enforcement update, and item 13, the list of decisions issued. Anybody wish to bring up any matters in relation to those? Councillor Kelly. Yes, Chair, on the uh, appeals update paper, um, I have a question just in relation to the uh, inclusion of the appeal um, determination there on the art straw quarries. And I do recall um, if this is the same application, I'm, I'm not sure if it is, but I think this may be the one that we didn't want from DOE back in the day. And we were kind of, there was a lot of arm twisting around this and and, and we were kind of maybe forced to take it on. But now we've, we've lost um, this first part of it. And I'm just wondering about the implications of, for council of that. And I'm just wondering about the quality of the material that came forward from the department, you know, to council in terms of supporting all of this stuff because um, I'd, I would have concerns uh, and obviously there was concerns there at the start from our own 
um, departmental staff because we didn't want this. Um, so I'm just I'm, I'm highlighting it. it's there now. There's that first part of the appeal, and I just I would like to have a little bit of um, you know one of our officers to kind of comment on it uh, rather than let it sort of slide. Just thanks to you. No, you're right. And I was I was reading it myself, and I was wondering about those those things as well. So I'm glad I'm glad you brought it up. Um, um, and I suppose some degree of further clarity is something that we would all appreciate. So Suzanne, I think you was it was it yourself, Andre? I keep picking in the wrong people up here. Go ahead, Andre. Thank you, through the chair, um, Councillor Kelly. I I don't believe that this was one. This was received in two thousand and nineteen for Art Straw. So this is there. There's an existing quarry at Art Straw, quite a substantial quarry, but that would would have approval prior to this council or sorry plan functions come to this council um so this extension this application was received in 2019 um and i think that was we accepted that okay as part of um our remit um so this is an eia determination only on that extension to an existing quarry it might be the old bridge i suppose in that locality there are other applications um, there's quite a substantial, um, well, very significant old bridge quarry, um, and the department and uh, the council have um, an interest in applications and enforcement issues in, in that. So it might be that area you're thinking about, maybe. Okay, happy enough, Pat. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Kelly. Uh, any other matters in relation to 11, 12, or 13 uh, in the open for information? None, none, nobody in the chat box. Okay. Members, quick uh, proposer and seconder to go into confidential. Councillor Kelly, Councillor McKinney, thank you. We'll just give it a wee minute. 